Mason County Joint Planning Commission is now in session. And I would advise everyone to please keep your comments, clapping. Please don't do it. This way we can get through the meeting faster, keep our mind focused on what we're here for, and give everybody the opportunity to speak. Um, at this time, we will have our roll call. Peggy Frame. Here. I'm Cope. Here. John Hutchings. Here. Tim Teagard. Here. Leslie Myers. Here. And that Walters? Here. Zandy Stewart? Here. David Reed? Here. I'm here. Michael Clark? Here. At this time, we will have our speakers start. Uh, you, you will be we time need, three minutes. We need a motion to uh, enter the recess public hearing. Right. Okay. Hold on. Get that here in just a second. I just want to remind the public of that. We have three minutes to speak. At this time, do I have a motion to go uh, out of the recess and back into the public hearing? I have a motion by Peggy Frame and second by Leslie Mars. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, so move. At this time, we'll have Cameron Miller come up and uh, speak to us. And after that, Melinda Miller, uh, she would come up and speak, be ready to speak when uh, Mr. Miller's finished. So my name is Cameron Miller. I live at 5274 Old Sarge Pike in Maislin, Kentucky. And I am the uh, next generation of farmers. So, uh, and I support uh, solar farms in Mason County. Uh, what exactly is a small next generation farmer supposed to do when they don't have over a thousand acres of land to do it with? Deal with. Uh, you know, tobacco was the only crop that my family has really ever raised. Uh, and that is now completely gone. There is no more tobacco uh, sellers or warehouses in uh, Mason County now. Mr. Miller, could you uh, speak a little closer to the mic? So, hemp wasn't really that great of a crop in the first place. It was terrible. And no money actually came back. So something terribly wrong went ha happened there. Sheep was something that was really good for a while, except it had no money behind it unless you had over 100 ewes producing the land every single season. You can, you can only have so many cows in one area and 125 acres of farmland. If you have no food or no rotation of grass or anything inside the farm, there is nothing to deal with. So I would proudly say that solar is a good opportunity for myself, my family, my mom and dad, uh, and my county, or more interest in county. Uh, that's all I really had to say. Thank you, Cameron. If you'll give your written notes to the quarter here. Next, we'll have uh, Melinda Miller. She will come and speak. Who's next, Ted? Oh, the next one would be Tom Saunders. I'm Linda Miller. I live at 5274 Old Sarge Pike. I support solar farms in Mason County. I guess I live on one of those uh, crown farm lands that people like to drive by and look at. I have lived and worked on our farm for over 27 years with my husband. My husband's been there for a lot longer than 27 years. We take great care of our farmland and would never allow anything to harm our farmland. Uh, it's our home and will always be our home. Uh, 
solar panels will be all around our farm. People say, you know, oh, the farmers are gonna, you know, move away, put solar all over the farm, move away, go to Florida. No, that's not gonna happen. You know, we will live on our farm. Solar panels will be, they can put them right next to our house if they want to. It's not gonna bother us, really. Uh, we will live on our farm. We love our farm. I mean, you know, we've been there for over 20, I've been there 27 years. Uh, and it's, I'm sorry, solar panels will disturb somebody else's pretty view of our farmland. And I would a lot rather have the view of a solar panel, solar panels than the neighbor's trashy trailer or whatever I have to drive by every day. I'd rather see that solar panel than that. Uh, so we love our farm, and we're not going to do anything to harm it or destroy it. I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Melinda. You leave your notes with her. Uh, Tom Sanders, Saunders, I'm sorry, Tom Saunders is next, and John Fulton will be after him. I'm Tom Saunders. You won't have any trouble keeping that with me. I'm slow enough. But uh, I've been a resident of Mason County all my life. I've been a farmer in Mason County for over 40 years. And I have entered into a lease agreement with National Grids. Uh, I did so to diversify my farm, not to quit. I had two sons that farmed with me. And I'm very happy that they come back to farm with me. But without solar, you know, I don't know how long into the future they can do it. I have I have diversified my farm throughout my career to try to try to keep it profitable, try to keep it going. And I see this as nothing else than a way to diversify my farm. And I have no, no way planning on leaving agriculture or retiring or anything else. Um, I would say that I've been a taxpayer. I've tried to be a good member of the community. And I feel like that if solar is regulated out of Mason County, that it affects my rights as a landowner. And I, I wish to have that known. Um, you know, I'm, I don't know if people don't want to look at it, but I, I went into this with my eyes wide open, and I read my contract, and I feel very comfortable that my land will be there for future generations. The only other thing that I would like to say tonight is that during a meeting at the Cox building, which turned into a workshop, Mr. Reed, you tried to make a motion at that meeting to have a setback of 3,000 feet. I think that was out of order. I think it was uninformed. I think it was biased. And I think it was uneducated. And I also feel like that anything you've done in this process since then has no credibility. And I want that on the record. Thank you very much. Thank you for the comment. At this time, we'll have John Fulton, and the next speaker will be Bill Peterson after Mr. Fulton. We ask that you not make personal references, please. This is a handout that Mr. Fulton uh, requested that you all see. It's, uh, it will not be going in the <coughs> I'm John Fulton. 5149 Old Sardis Pike, Mays Hill. I am three miles north of Mays Lake, and I own about 400 acres. And I always have been from Mays Lake. I was, went to Mays Lake Elementary School, Mays Lake County High School, and graduated from college here in the first year that they had college here. My name's even on the wall here somewhere. I have some information that you may not be aware of, and I have given you the fact sheet from the Soil Conservation Service concerning Lee's Creek watershed, which surrounds Mays Lake as well as my property. It is an area of 7,433 acres, 
there is a map on the back of the back sheet. According to the Kentucky Division of Water, the stream does not support aquatic life due to nitrate, nitrite, sedimentation, siltation, and total jehydal nitrogen. It has been listed as a 303D, which is a list of impaired water bodies that do not meet water quality standards. High levels of E. coli have also been found. It's obvious that great pollution already exists here, caused by our farming practices. So the more acreage used for solar, the fewer acres that will pollute the environment. Therefore, it should be obvious to all that solar is a good thing. More prosperity and less pollution. What's wrong with that? I really think the Lord is wanting to bless this community if we'll let him. Please, even if a few people, plus even if a few people tie it to their churches, the churches will benefit. Therefore, I think our decisions Anyway, I think our decisions, because we've all made decisions, we've all investigated this thing before we ever signed up for any solar panels because we just gave it the third degree any time we get a chance. And we've all come to the conclusion, I'm sure, that it's a proper thing to do because we don't want to hurt our farm property. It's our inheritance, our heritage. I was raised on this farm. My grandfather had part of this farm. My father received part of it. And I received part of mine from him. So there's nothing on earth that would want, make us want to hurt it. And we should not have the right to tell somebody else what they can have on their property. It's like, I should, not, I should not have the right, for example, to tell you you can't park your car or we can see it because we don't like the color. Or you can't keep it in your driveway because it might damage the environment since it burns fossil fuels. Think about it. Just please be fair. We want only to have a better chance for a future here. So I ask you to please do the right thing it could be that we can retain our heritage with your help. Thank you. Thank you. And at this time, we'll have Bill Peterson, and after Bill, I believe it's Tinker Clark. Anyone who's speaking, please be sure to include your address as well uh, with your name. Please. I'm Bill Peterson. 838 Terre Haute Drive, Maysville. You come into Mason County from any direction on the major roads, you see large welcoming signs. You also have three small words down below it. History, culture, commerce. The history of the county has been well documented and offers often represents a prominent role in the state's development. Culture has been rich and sometimes colorful, and it ties well to the rich history. Commerce, it has been good in the past, but in recent years, I'll refer to it as the shrinking commerce. Yes, there have been several very positive gains recently, but those gains have not offset the losses of the past two decades, mainly Browning Emerson, DPNL, Federal mobile, crystal tissues, the tobacco industry, the warehouses, Parker Tobacco, and much more. Mason County used to be counted in the top tier when looking at the median household income. Today, we are well below the state and national uh, median household levels as reported by the U.S. Census. We are $3,453 below the state median household income. More alarming, we are $14,750 below the U.S. median household income. Over 60% of our students in our school system qualify for the free lunch program. This decline and stagnation does not need to continue and it can start to change today with your decisions to welcome a new 
new industry that will send a positive message to other industries that are looking for welcoming locations to establish business. You, the Joint Planning and Zoning Board, must consider the difference between the factual testimony and supplemental documentation information provided by the pro-seller against the speculation, fear-mongering, parade from the voices of no. Have any of you even read a company farmer agreement? The county needs this. With no more needless delays, move this forward. As far as setbacks go, keep in mind that every foot of setback is costing somebody a lot of money. Consider adopting the model solar ordinance developed by the Mason County Farmers, you have it in your package, or the Kentucky model solar ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. At this time, we'll have Ginger Clark come to speak, and after her will be Cheryl French. Uh, Mr. Peterson, did he give you a copy? Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Just get close. close to the okay. Pick up well. My name is Ginger Clark, and I live at 6080 Helena Road in Maislet, Kentucky. Why is it important for me and other farm owners to have solar energy production in Mason County? It is whatever is looming in the future. What happens to our farm once the primary farmer can no longer do the job? My father has been a fantastic steward of our farmland. He has studied and taken courses in solar conservation to have the knowledge to best preserve the land and topsoil. He has rotated the crops for as long as I can remember. But what do we do with our farmland now that he's retired? He is 78 years old. My sister and I are in our 50s, and we don't have the capacity to farm our farmland. My farm manager is also nearing the age of retirement. Our daughters have chosen other professions that have promised and a guaranteed salary. We have discussed leasing the land to mega farmers. That sounds great, doesn't it? But it's not. Because the people that, who lease the land are interested in the highest yield and return on their investment. They, don't, they won't be good stewards to our land. They will harvest the ground until it can no longer produce. They will increase the chemicals in our watersheds and increase cattle will also do the same. The fertile topsoil will diminish. We are not losing primary farmland with solar. We are repurposing it. It is a government overreach to deny us the ability to harvest the sun. Our family did not make this decision lightly. We discussed and researched for months before deciding on a company that we felt shared our values and common interests. One of the biggest complaints from anti-solar people is, to, is the worry of leaving the panels with no plan for decommissioning. We put a decommissioning clause in the lease agreement. Why would we choose to do something that would destroy our land? We want to save it for years and generations to come. Our farm is a birthright and something that the Clarks take great pride in. My daughter and niece are the seventh generation, at least, to live on our farm. That is something that very few people can, can claim. We all take great pride in and love our land. It's important that we keep it in the family and not sell it in pieces at this time. We have no one who can farm it. Hopefully in 30 years, we will, that will not be the case. We will have someone to farm it. I recommend that the Planning and Zoning Board and the Fiscal Court use the proposed setback submitted by Mr. Bill Marshall and written by five Mason County farmers or the Kentucky Model Solar Zoning Ordinance. Both speak to the best practices from across the United States uh, in the siting of solar facilities. Both consider logical language specific to solar energy. If you're against solar, you're against the future of Mason County. Thank you, Ginger. Please give your written notes to the quarter here. We're noticing, I don't know if it's feedback or somebody's cell phone or what the deal is, but I would request 
that everyone has a cell phone, please make sure that they are off. Uh, at this time, we'll have Cheryl French come, and after her will be Shirley Fulton. Thank you. I'm Cheryl French. I'm a retired veterinarian and also a small farmer. Um, my brothers and I have uh, three farms in the Mason County area. My farm is at 7023 Clarkson Hill Road, Maysville. Uh, we don't have any farms with the solar programs yet, but it's something that we're interested in and we really would like to take advantage of it if we do have an ordinance passed that would allow us. When I first heard about the farm, the solar farm project, I thought it would be a great benefit to farmers and also to Mason County. But I was concerned about the down the road effect when solar farm was decommissioned. I'd heard stories of contaminated landfills and solar companies disappearing and, let, and leaving the farmers and community to deal with the issues. But in the last six months, I've learned a great deal more about the solar farms and the issues of cleanup and termination of leases. My understanding is that each lease has decommissioning or clean up language describing values, contents, and to, in order to protect the lesser and the land. It's a type of bond. The bond acts like an insurance policy. If the solar company does not clean up the land or the panels or the debris for any reason, the insurance policy or the bond kicks in and provides the funds to the lesser or a named beneficiary. That name beneficiary could be the city or the county or the owners of the farm. The solar company or its successor provides the bond and pays for it. The bond amount is reviewed periodically to ensure the value is enough to cover the cost of cleanup, inflation, and possible changes to regulations. The bonds are legally binding insurance policies. That, these policies, these bonds, are not managed by the solar company, and the bonds are controlled and overseen by third-party professional insurance providers. Plus, the bonds are reviewed every five years. I think there's a draft solar ordinance submitted by Bill Marshall at, to this hearing, uh, which provides a suggested language that meets the requirements for cleanup and bonds, and this language should be included in the Mason County Solar Ordinance. Also, since the farms are private property, the landowner needs the bond protection. So every lease should have an adequate bond covering the cleanup and decommissioning that meets the state requirements at minimum. The language of the ordinance should not be excessively restrictive. Um, I hope that the Zoning and Planning Commission will be supportive in helping us, the landowners and the farmers, to succeed in this opportunity. Please do not place unnecessary language that could prevent or kill the opportunity suspension offers. If the ordinance, ordinance could be kept simple and direct to the point, it would, be a long, it would go a long way to helping everyone understand what's needed. This large scale solar project is a great opportunity for Mason County, our farmers and landowners. I recognize it is the Zoning and Planning Commission's responsibility to guide, review, recommend changes, and enforce regulations. But please do so, keeping in mind, solar farms can and should be a source of economic stimulation for the county. Thank you, Cheryl. Appreciate that. Um, at this time, we'll have uh, Shirley Fulton come. Teresa Martin will be next. Yeah. everyone that is part of the rules that the Planning Commission passed on Tuesday for this public hearing that if you're not wearing masks in this auditorium you will be escorted out by one of the police officers attending the public hearing. That is what just happened and we will take that seriously because in order to use this facility we have to abide by MCTC's rules. Thank you. Emma. Okay. After Cheryl's so educated presentation you're going to get a plain old, plain old mom. Um, 
I know Lynette likes to ask questions, but uh, it's my turn and I want to ask a question, okay? How many of you sitting up here at this table have ever sat down and filled out an income tax form that said 100% of my income has come from farming? Raise your hand. 100% of my income has come from farming. I got 77 years on farms where 100% of my income has come from farming. If you go about six miles out the road, you'll see uh, Samuel Stroke, Mary Allen Stroke's run. I'm six generations away from him. Our children have two other Revolutionary War soldiers in their bloodline, too. Our three Revolutionary War soldiers fought for us so that we could have the freedom to own land and to do on that land what we want to do on that land. You all don't understand what it's like to wrestle a living from something that you love so much that you would bleed for, for your land. So I want to tell you a little bit about earning your living in farming. I like to call it mom and the speed bump and the brick wall. Mom is mother nature. She is one of your opponents when you're trying to farm. The speed bump is our, um, Everything that you buy, you pay their price for. Everything that you sell, you get their price for it. So that's kind of an uncomfortable speed bump. The, the brick wall, though, the brick wall can really stop you. And the brick wall is the unintended consequences of decisions made by bureaucrats. Well, let me tell you a little bit about decisions made by bureaucrats. My daddy started farming back in 1950 and he got real interested in artificial insemination and learned everything about it and was going to go into this big artificial insemination business and you had to get the product to Purdue University real fast. So he learned how to fly a plane. He bought a Piper Cub. It was yellow with a little red stripe down the side of it. I loved flying around in it. He started shopping for bulls. He made a landing strip on our back 40. He even built an airplane hangar. That's, that's ma'am, that's three minutes. Thank you, Shirley. At this time, we'll have Teresa Martin, and after her will be Rick Ross. Hello, my name is Teresa Martin, and I reside at 6210 Parker Lane in Hazlett, Kentucky. Under Kentucky State Statute KRS 100 and Kentucky law, the Mason County Comprehensive Plan establishes the basis for all land uses and related planning and zoning ordinance in Mason County. Secondly, the land use management ordinance for Mason County states, this ordinance is designated to guide land use decisions in Mason County as a means of implementing the comprehensive plan. As commissioners, you have the solemn duty to follow and uphold both the comprehensive plan and the land use management ordinances. They are co-joined overarching documents for all land use decisions in Mason County. As commissioners, you have the solemn duty to fulfill your obligations that all land use decisions are made for the best interest of all Mason County citizens and not for the few. The present land use management ordinance specifically defines prime agricultural land as a highly valued natural resource that needs protection. As such, prime agricultural land has been assigned to land use district of either A1 or A2. A1 and A2 districts have been established to preserve 
and protect the decreasing supply of prime agricultural land. I respectfully submit that the Land Use Management Ordinance does not provide for the construction of utility scale merchant solar electric generating facilities on A1 or A2 zone ag land, as this would not be compatible with the position of preserving and protecting prime ag land for future generations. Industrial scale solar facilities located on A1 and A2 prime ag land would constitute a significant change in land use policy for Mason County with both short and long term impacts for local taxpayers, real estate markets, economic development, watersheds, and historic resources. The negative impacts of industrial solar will not be limited to adjoining property owners and displaced businesses. It will affect everyone in Mason County. This is not the legacy that the future Mason County generations expect to be handed nor inherited. It would be unpardonable and environmentally irresponsible to desecrate a non-renewable natural resource of prime agricultural land in a manner that produces minimal and short-term benefit for out-of-state entities, then lying it in waste and unfertile for future generations. I pray to God that he anoint each of you with his divine wisdom as you weigh the evidence on the scales of justice. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll have Rick Ross and after <coughs> Mr. Ross. That is Ross, correct? Yes. Okay, and after him we will have Jason Gifford. I'm Rick Ross. I am a junior Perter in Maysville right now, formerly of 6149 Cliff Pike in Mays Lick. Uh, regarding school funding, I come to you today testifying as a citizen of Mason County who is also an expert in school finance. The Solar and Mason County Group has repeatedly made the claim that transforming farms into industrialized solar facilities would result in $273,000 per year for Mason County schools. It simply is not true. When local assessment are increased to certain levels, the state actually cuts the funding to schools. Uh, I began correcting uh, those numbers uh, that, that that group had put forward. Eventually, many yellow shirt brain people came to a meeting that I happened to attend every month. And I could tell by the way that they were meeting me that they had a case of FUD, which is fear, uncertainty, and doubt regarding how school finances work. I again explained that the increases in assessment they claimed would result in nearly all the claimed benefits for local schools being negated. Still filled with much FUD, Mr. Marshall contacted the Department of Education, and after speaking with them, he sent me an email, which I'm quoting now. Mason County Schools will receive $278,000 or more in real estate property tax, but that will be partially, he says, offset by a decrease of $251,000 in state seed funding. This leaves us $26,000 per year. But only if no one loses property value and no students leave due to panels, day and night noise, or razor wire. The fact that a 90% reduction in their initial claim is considered a partial reduction speaks to how desperate this group is to portray a community benefit that simply does not exist. At the rate of $26,000 per year, the $8 million promised in their flyers over 30 years would actually take 307 years to manifest. Regarding property values, the claim that property values will not be affected by industrializing farmland is laughable. While I appreciate the solar companies commissioning their own studies, showing the results they desire, my wife and I decided to become the case study to prove that even just discussion of industrialized solar will make it difficult to sell a home at market value. We work with the most reputable real estate agent in the county to determine the price for our home in the hottest real estate market ever. Homes are selling in days. We were literally the only home this agent had an inventory within the entire county. Our home was purchased for $140,000 in 2013 with about $100,000 in upgrades. The realtor uh, suggested an asking price of $289.9. We had many interested buyers and all but one stated they loved the home, yet it did not sell. The stated reason for not making an offer by nearly all potential buyers, fear of solar panels on Cliff Pike. Eventually, we sold the home after nearly a $40,000 price cut a loss of about 14 percent. This is with no panels in place. What will happen when they're actually being constructed? 
During the public meetings at La Siona and National Grid Renewables, I asked That's three minutes. If, if any of their executives live near solar panels. Not surprisingly, none do. Mr. Ross, Mr. Ross, please. At this time, we'll have Jason Gifford speak, and after Jason, will be Debbie Estrell. I'm Jason Gifford. Hello, my family. I'm Jason Gifford. Hello, my family. We live at 6266 U.S. 68 Maysville. We own and operate a farm in Maysville. We have signed a contract with a solar development company. I'm asking for your support of utilizing solar energy resources in Mason County. In order for this to be possible, we need to implement rezoning. Reasonable zone, rezoning regulations. Uh, second, I'd like to mention that the board should view this from an unbiased perspective. It was prevailing in the previous meeting that that members on the board viewing from a biased perspective. For example, when the solar of Mason County was speaking, for all the information presented, the professional expert site of location was requested or to be known where the data came from, or citizens' voice of Mason County, some information was presented that's strictly opinionated or the data created by the presenter themselves. No information provided by the citizens' voice of Mason County was requested for the professional expert sources to be cited. If any members of the board cannot view this from an unbiased perspective, they should not participate in the specific hearings and meetings as biased. Perspectives will lead to a skewed outcome, which likely would not be the best outcome for Mason County or the people within the county either way. The verdict follows. The decision should be driven by unbiased factual information. The budget, the operating budget for the Mason County has, has been increasing every year. There has been a 20% increase from the 17-18 fiscal year to the 20-21 fiscal year, equaling $3.6 million. Bringing solar energy to the county would increase revenue for Mason County. This added revenue to our local tax district can support improved community services and or reduce tax liability on all taxpayers. This includes our first responders, schools, health department, library extension service, and fiscal court. All county services, including EMS, Sheriff's Office, and Mason County Landfill, would expect to continue to be growing and will need additional revenue to keep these things moving. This could be a very big step in the right direction to provide sustainable tax revenue to Mason County and also supply an off-peak income to several farmers. My question is where will all those additional funds come from? Us, the Mason County taxpayers. So if we could bring additional revenue to the county, why wouldn't officials at least sit down with some common sense and study the facts and make the right decision? This opens the opportunity for larger companies to consider investing in Mason County to utilize renewable energy as a source of power. This would be more jobs, more money for local businesses, and other revenue for the county. As a farmer, we take care of the land to pass it on to the next generation, trying to leave it a better than it was when we acquired it. I hope Mason County officials have that same mentality. If not, our kids will not have any reason to stay here. I understand when some changes come to opposition. That's, we, sir, that's three minutes. Right. Thank you, Jason. This time we'll have Debbie we'll Estill come to speak, and after her will be Elise Elling Ashton. I believe that's what it is. My name is Debbie Estill. I reside at 6170 Park Relation in Mays Lake. <laughs> All right, I'm a lifelong resident of this community. I am not anti-solar, but I'm truly concerned about the loss of prime farmland. My father was a farmer, as was his father, and his father before him. The same was true of my mother's family. There is no question that it was hard work, there were good times and bad, but they all loved what they did. They were good stewards of the land. I currently reside on my mother's family farm. Crops continue to be grown, conservation is practiced, and soil continues to be fertile and productive. Our agricultural land is the most valuable natural resource in Mason County. With droughts in the West, food shortages can become a real threat in the near future. Where will our food come from if we have thousands of acres of prime agricultural land 
that is covered with merchant electric generating facilities. Our current comprehensive plan protects our land and recognizes its vital importance to our community, as does our current zoning ordinances. We will never be able to recoup the land loss should these large-scale solar energy generating facilities be allowed on precious soil. It's been a real struggle to say what needs to be said with little a lot of time to speak. We do have petitions signed by nearly a thousand individuals opposing the placement of industrial solar facilities on prime agricultural land. Both the online petition and the petition from door-to-door -door canvassing are entered into record. There was a glitch with the online petition and several local residents erroneously appear with out-of-county or state addresses. There are very few duplicate signatures between the two patient petitions. The signatures speak volumes as to what our community feels about such a massive project. The signatures are from all areas of Mason County and Maysville. This indicates it is just not just a Mays League issue, it is an entire county-wide issue. I have often heard when individuals are motivated by greed, they ignore the harm their actions cause for others. This issue has divided families, friends, and neighbors. It has been a devastating blow to a once close-knit community. You have an arduous task. You must not only decide what is right for today, but you have the responsibility for, to do what is right for future generations. The wrong decision could prove catastrophic. I would like to thank each of you for your time and end with a very appropriate Native American proverb. We do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Debbie. Debbie, she needs your notes. Okay, and next we will have Elise. Okay. <laughs> and after at least will be Patrick Pepper. region with underground drainage systems such as sinkholes, swallow holes, and caves. Karst landscapes are shaped and carved by water. Water seeping into soluble limestone bedrock can erode and dissolve the bedrock. This dissolution causes a porous, Swiss cheese-like terrain with the karst features shown below. Water entering them travels underground and is later discharged in springs. A significant portion of Mason County is karst prone. Many karst prone areas are now targeted for large-scale industrial solar development. The Mayslick area is predominantly karst prone, as shown on the KDS map. Numerous sinkholes, springs, and swallow hills exist in Mayslick already, and the potential exists for more to develop in the future. The formation of sinkholes is the most prominent karst-related hazard in Kentucky, according to the Kentucky Emergency Management. This map shows recorded sinkholes in, in Kentucky, including Mason County, and this is not all of them, by any means. Karst landscapes can be worn away from the surface and dissolve from a weak point in the bedrock. If enough erosion occurs in underground bedrock, sinkholes can result. And you all saw the, the Corvette Museum when they had a sinkhole there. Sinkholes can damage the foundation of buildings and roads and cause damage to buried water lines and electrical conduits. The following human activities can cause increased prevalence of sinkholes. Alteration or diversion of surface runoff, compaction of unconsolidated <coughs> soils, adding weight above cavities by constructing roads, waterways, or structures, artificially creating ponds of surface water and groundwater withdrawals. Construction of large-scale solar facilities involves many, if not all, of these activities. 
There are already lawsuits in other parts of the country where excessive stormwater runoff from industrial solar facilities has caused serious damage to nearby properties, wetlands, and rivers. In a karst landscape, runoff mitigation is even more challenging because water flows in karst systems are extremely difficult to map. There's 10 times more water flowing underground than above ground. Flow paths may not take roots that are apparent from the topography of the land. The movement of water flows and pollutants cannot be directly observed on underground car systems. And contaminants entering an aquifer at one location can travel underground for long distances. Cadmium used in thin film photovoltaic panels is highly toxic to humans, animals, and aquatics. The Center for Disease Control states cadmium is a highly toxic carcinogen that is harmful to most of the body systems. OSHA also lists cadmium as a toxic chemical. Cadmium telluride panels are currently the second leading type of solar implementation worldwide and comprise 50% of the U.S. market in 2020. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go quick here. Um, leaching tests in Europe have shown cadmium telluride panels have a leaching potential of approximately 23 grams of cadmium per kilowatt installed. Silicon panels have a leaching potential of approximately 4 grams of lead per kilowatt installed. Solar panels can also begin leaching after damage from extreme weather, such as tornadoes, high winds, and hail. Okay, that's three minutes. Thank you, Leach. At this time, we'll have Patrick Pfeffer come <coughs> forward to speak, and after Patrick will be Blake Boyd. <laughs> My name is Patrick Pepper. My name is Patrick Pepper and I live at 6055 Lemonsburg, Hazelick Road. I am the president of Citizens Voice of Mason County and the son of the late Joe Pepper. And before my father's passing, he mentioned several times that the solar developers were interested in Mason County. And although he didn't give me too much information, he did have a lot of concerns with them. And just like my dad and the rest of us here, we want to have plenty of growth in this county, as does Mason, Citizens Voice in Mason County. But we strive for smart growth. And with that, we have a lot of concerns with these solar companies coming in and developing such large solar facilities. So I'd like to give you a quote from the Interject Solar Project Developer. Solar panels contain no toxic materials, and you could grind them up and put them in your coffee and drink them. Interject is one of several companies who are interested in developing land in Mason County. They held a July public informational meeting in the Maysville Cox building. And when asked if the solar panels contained toxic materials, he was quoted saying the above. Later on in that same meeting, we asked if the Mount Orb solar facility that they own contained solar panels with cadmium telluride. His answer was yes. So I'm going to read out loud some extracts from the CDH Materials Safety and Data Sheet and Fire Protection and Safety Foundation relating to the toxicity and handling the cadmium telluride. 6.2, environmental precautions prevent farther leakage or spillage if safe to do so. Do not let product enter drainage. Discharge into the environment must be avoided. Methods and materials for containment and cleaning up, picking up, and arranging disposal without creating dust keep in suitable closed containers for disposal. Cadmium telluride is commonly used in photo photovoltaic technology. When the panels are damaged by fire, it introduces potentially dangerous level amount of materials known as cadmium, which is a carcinogenic. Some materials used in the solar power components are known to be a problem when they decompose in fire. Pan panels damaged by fire or extreme weather have the possibility to leak this carcinogenic. We seem to be relying on the developers to give us unbiased information on cash benefits, energy production, property values, setbacks, toxicity, as well as water runoff and decommissioning. A business exists to make money. A government exists to protect the people. I ask that the Joint Planning Commission do not underestimate the toxic materials in these solar panels. 
I ask that we need to have extensive water and soil sampling throughout the whole life cycle of the solar project and an outright ban on cabin and telluride. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. At this time, we'll have Blake Boyd, and after Blake will be Austin Matheny. Blake Boyd, 6077 Helena Road, Mace Lake. First off, I want to thank you guys for the time and effort you put in, and it seems like more often than it should be, you guys have a thankless job, and I know this is a challenging topic, and I just appreciate what all you guys are doing. Nine billion. Nine billion is the number of what the world population is expected to be by 2050. Now, in order to meet demand, agriculture will have to increase production by 60 to 70% from our current levels. Now, that becomes a, a big challenge when you start taking prime farming out of production, if it's even possible. And uh, as it stands right now, with several upon several thousands of acres in Mason County contracted for industrial solar. Um, you know, that it just it hits home the fact that, you know, there's a lot of experts that, that really believe in the future it's not going to be our energy or our technology that's the focal point of society. It's going to be our food, because we all have to have that. And, and it, when you start taking land out of production, it makes it harder and harder to meet produ production goals of feeding not only our country, but we're an exporter that feed a lot of other countries. Now, I'm not against uh, renewable energy. I do think it has its place. Rooftops of buildings, they're going to reclaim strip mines in the desert where they get maximum sunlight, or unproductive areas. That doesn't fit the description of Mason County, but it does seem to appeal to a lot of the foreign-owned energy companies as an easy place to acquire land for their primary objectives of getting government subsidies and fulfilling green energy credits. Folks, agriculture is the lifeline of small communities like ours and has been since the inception of this country. There are countless businesses and services that depend on the millions of dollars generated annually by local farms. I'm a proud sixth generation of Matt Mason County and that drives 100% of my income from production agriculture. If nearly all the prime farmland is taken out of production for the next 25 to 40 years in Mason County, I don't see how it can be sustainable for my generation and to provide for our family and community. And I find it ironic, in an effort to save the climate, we're going to destroy our local environment. The Michigan State study found that an acre of corn sequesters 36,000 pounds of carbon out of the environment. You know, th there's one thing the good Lord's not making any more of, and that's quality farmland. Uh, just please, please don't send us young farmers back. And we'd love to have the opportunity that all these farmers in this crowd have had to provide for our families and the community and do our part in feeding the nine billion. Thank you. Thank you, Blake. This time, this time we're going to take a recess for five minutes and then we'll come back.
five minutes, y'all. Please return to your seats. everyone that we are guests here at MCTC. One of the requirements of being here is wearing a mask over your mouth and your nose. If you're not doing that, you will be escorted off the premises. No more warnings, okay? Please do that. At this time, we'll have Austin Matheny come to speak, and after Austin will be Steve Clary. Austin Matheny, 6706 U.S. 68, Maysville, Kentucky, 41055. As a child, I spent countless hours looking across pastures in Maysville, eager for the day I could join the heritage of my family and begin my own farming operation. Since I can remember, I've had a passion for agriculture and a hope for my future in the industry. Upon completion of high school, I continued my edu education at one of the premier land grant universities in the country. At Kansas State University, I received the Bachelor of Animal Science and Industry with a minor in life experiences. Life experiences that opened my eyes to the endless opportunities in profitable production agriculture. Growing up traveling the country, I've seen farming operations from coast to coast, each with different production systems that allowed them to be profitable, with not a single operation being the same as the next, but each operation possessing a unique outlook on agriculture and a common goal to feed the world. When I take a step back and think, where does agriculture start? It starts with the very soil underneath our feet that generations before us have depended on to provide for their families. Over the past couple of years, people in our community have seemed to have forgotten the cardinal role of caring for the land and leaving it better for the next generations. With tight margins today, you can't stay idle in agriculture and say, our operation has always done it this way, and this is how it always be done. Yet people have done it for years and resist the thought of change. These same people who have resisted the change are taking, have taken a progressive outlook on agriculture are the same ones who went head first when large corporations started waiving flashy contracts with the hopes of becoming profitable. To these same individuals, I ask, why haven't you taken advantage of technology and modern farming practices to turn your operation profitable for now? President Dwight D. Eisenhower once said, farming looks mighty easy when your, pencil is, when your plow is a pencil and you're a thousand miles from a cornfield. If I had to guess, these large corporations couldn't tell you much about agriculture and only see the land as a tool to hopefully pad their pockets. The reality is that a farmer and a steward of the land who ultimately provides for both you and me. In a community where I've always heard growing up that there aren't many young farmers coming home to take over the family operation or start farming are the same voices who don't lend a helping hand to young farmers. With all this land being proposed to be destroyed, I can only imagine the young farmers in our area who have been eager to begin the path to successful production agriculture, but they haven't been given the chance. To the farmers who are eager to sign up for land for these destructive services, I encourage you to reach out to young farmers who want to carry on the tradition of production agriculture. To the committee making the decision, I urge you to understand production agriculture is a vital resource we have in Mason County. These short-sighted plans from the solar company are not what we need to make our community profitable. Keep the land that is owned for agriculture purposes zoned for what it's exactly meant to do. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. At this time, we'll have Steve Clary come, and after Steve will be Charlie Boyd. Steve Clary with uh, 5330 Lake of Pine, Mays Lake, Kentucky. Um, first of all, I would also like to thank you for participating in what you do because I'm sure it's, you don't get paid near enough <coughs> for the time you put in. Being part of a civic organization and doing things for the public is sometimes a thankless job, and I appreciate what you're trying to do. However, I just want to make a few uh, points. One, <coughs> I'm not necessarily against soul. I'm, I'm a proponent of controlled, managed, sustainable growth. 
I am not against solar in general, solar as a principle. However, I did have some concerns about large-scale solar systems in Mason County. Most people, the two scarcest resources in their lifetime are time and money. In production agriculture, there's a third scarcest resource, and that's land. So it's time, land, and money. Not necessarily in that order, but those are the three scarcest resources. And in the past three or four years, actually throughout my life, I've been a proponent of getting young people started in agriculture or keeping younger people started in agriculture. And I have a few concerns about the size of this proposal and how that could help young people stay in farm. So if you, for example, if you take 6,000 acres, that can only, to me, that only leads to one thing. It just puts up more restrictions for young people to enter into production agriculture. Uh, second, I've heard a lot of talk about tax money and tax income for local entities and special taxing districts. However, with the exception of one person who's a representative of, of a special taxing district, I've not heard from one person representing a special taxing district on how much money they anticipate on getting from the size of this solar project. So that leads me to kind of question the accuracy of the numbers that's being tossed around. I just want you to consider that. I want you to consider the long-term impact that we'll have on Mason County and on Mason County production agriculture. 6,000 acres, or whatever the number it is, is a significant reduction in the ability or the resources to produce food and fiber for the population. So I just want you to strongly consider that and take it into take it under advisement. If you have any questions, feel free to come out in the county and ask some folks out there. Okay? Thanks. Thank you, Steve. At this time, we'll have Charlie Boyd, and after him, uh, I hope I read this right, Werner Ogilwell. Um, please, one after that. I'm Charlie Boyd, reside at 1677 Helena Road in Basil Lake. First, I'd like to begin in thanking each of you for serving. I've had the opportunity to serve on many local, state, and national boards, and uh, all of those have been a voluntary position, so I, I know you're overworked and underpaid and, and, and totally understand that. But sincerely appreciate your dedication and time you've put forward up to this point. We only got three minutes, so we're going to keep this brief. This thing is not very complicated. We have special interests from foreign countries that have consumed retiring farmers who in most cases, kids do not want to come back to the farm. Not all, but in most. And then we have inspiring young agriculturalists that you just heard speak. Now if that doesn't get your blood pumping, you've got a problem. Agriculture has the greatest opportunity for success in the next 50 years than we've ever had before. And I was traveling Tuesday night and I could only hear bits and pieces of some of the speakers. And one made, he alluded to beef cattle production and I actually didn't even know he owned a beef cow, but maybe he did some research. But if you want to know some facts about beef cattle production in Kentucky, Kentucky ranks eighth in the United States in beef cattle production out of 50 states. That's pretty impressive. First, east of the Mississippi River. Guess where Mason County ranks in Kentucky? In the 45th percentile. The window of opportunity for added growth and success is huge. But it takes talented young people with the ability to adapt to change and technology. We can't farm like our grandfather and great-grandfather used to farm. That's part of why some people are in this predicament. Now on solar, I'm not against solar. I almost put a farm in solar because we didn't have electric there. But industrial solar consuming thousands of acres in prime farmland is the problem. And I get the opportunity to travel quite a bit. You know, I, there's no way you can call them solar farms. They're not so farms. They're solar cemeteries. They're thousands of acres 
garnished with black panels, penitentiary wire, and some shrubbery. Well, that's impressive. That's just what adjoining property owners want and need. It, the question is, but it won't devalue your property. Are you kidding? What planet did you come from? <laughs> Folks, that's the problem. It's disrespect. You know, I hear that question. I've asked some people that are leasees, and they say, well, it's, it's my farm, my land. I can do whatever I want to with it. I agree with you. That's three, sir, that's three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. At this time, now how do you pronounce your name? <laughs> uh, our next speaker after that will be Mary Marshall. Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate. Yep. A little bit closer to the mic, please. Yep. I appreciate this opportunity to speak to you on the things that are very important to the majority of us. Uh, My name is Bernard Oxawalla of 18 West 3rd Street, Maysville. Um, I want to follow up on some of the hazardous chemicals that some of the others mentioned. The disposal of the panels. We know that the damaged panels will be replaced, uh, but panels are hazardous waste. That brings up some important questions which I don't think have been resolved yet. For example, once they've been determined that they're damaged, how long are they allowed to be on the field before they're extracted? Once they're taken out of service, where are they stored? And how long can they be stored in that location before final disposal? And another really big question is obsolescence. Some interesting facts are that technology has improved by about 5% per year for the past 10 years. And another interesting fact is that panels lose their uh, capability by about 1% per year. That's a 6% differential between a new panel and a year old panel, and every year thereafter. It doesn't take a finance degree to figure out that you're very quickly going to become uh, disadvantaged competitively. Uh, so in 10 to 15 years, to stay competitive, these companies must either replace every panel or abandon the solar cemetery. Uh, if you don't believe my 10 to 15 year number, Consider that you can depreciate uh, solar panels 85% over six years. That means the federal government thinks they're obsolete in six years. Uh, so that brings up more questions. What are you going to do with panels that are taken out of service? Where do you store them? And for how long? before they're disposed of, how do you get rid of otherwise good panels? This is why I support uh, a moratorium where we can answer these and the hundreds of other questions that are being raised about the solar facilities. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Bernard. At this time, we'll have Mary Marshall come speak, and after her will be uh, Yeah. Is it Melinda? Okay, Melinda. Melinda Palmer will be next. Okay. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> it's hard to read. <laughs> Mary Frances Marshall, 683 Key Pike, Maysville, Kentucky. We have all heard these statements. This is being rushed. Everything is being done in secret. Let's have a moratorium so we can study more. <coughs> Here are the facts and a timeline that I've been able to glean 
about solar in Mason County. Solar first appeared on the agenda of this joint planning committee in May of 2019. In December of 2020, the late Judge Executive Joe Pepper circulated draft solar ordinance based on the Kentucky model ordinance. Why the 20 month gap in the timeline, you ask? I suspect Joe Fetter was doing his due diligence by trying to establish the assets and liabilities of solar and evaluate his commercial potential for his beloved Mesa County. On March the 23rd, 2021, Citizen Voice Corporation came out of sleep mode, their own words, with the sole intention of stopping solar. From that point forward, the model ordinance for solar was apparently shelved and discussed no more. By my account this year, you've had seven meetings, some in person, some by Zoom. Solar workshops and solar discussion were agenda items on all of these meetings. You have also taken the time to visit solar installations both under construction and completed. Solar companies have presented you with documentation of their work and their adherence to regulation and held open houses. The website, Solar for Mason County, has published truthful and scientific information to educate us all. I stand before you as a representative of a family whose ancestors fought at Valley Forge and flew bombers over war-torn Italy and Nazi Germany. They endured these hardships to preserve yours and our constitutional rights that basic right of all people to acquire, use, and dispose of property freely. Let's do the math. The aforementioned 20 months plus the year 2021 20, equals 31 months. So we're up to two years and seven months after solar first appeared on your agenda. If after two years and seven months of service and study, you officially declare a moratorium on solar regulation, or just kick the can down the road, you are doing this county no service. If after two years and seven months you pu publish a pernicious, overregulated ordinance who stand to violate our constitutional property rights with what are called regulatory takings, this could possibly expose, expose the commission to needless litigation. The Commonwealth has invested considerable time and money in training this board of commissioners. Please do not squander that investment. I urge you to do your due diligence like the judge did for the economic and ecological future of Mason County. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. At this time, young man, in fact, there was a phone. I'm talking to you. You can leave. Take your phone and leave. Now. Sorry, sir, you. I don't quite understand. Yeah. He's autistic. Oh, I didn't know. Okay, I'm sorry. You still want me to leave? No, as long as he puts his phone away. Let's go. Oh, how about we? That's sad. That's it, sad. It's disturbing. It was not your turn. It was? You are the turn. Yeah, you're the turn. His phone was not turned up. He was not bothered. I'm not issuing an apology. I asked for phones to be gone. It was on his phone. I heard noise. I want to apologize. You get your three minutes. Let's go. Before I begin. Before I begin, I would like to, it to be noted on this record that Mr. Ross's DIY upgraded home with a large unfinished pond in the back sold for more than $100,000, more than what he originally bought it for. After a $100,000 investment. <laughs> Still $100,000 more than what you originally bought it for. After which is an increase in property value. <laughs> We're not here to discuss. My name is Michaela Palmer, and I live at 6463 Kentucky Highway 419. I'm here to address some of the questions and concerns raised by Citizens Voice and Annette Walters on Tuesday regarding solar panels and solar energy. 
it is illogical for this zoning and planning commission to allow personal solar but not utility solar. Ma'am, can you spend, can you stand a little closer to the microphone, please? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? A little bit. It is illogical for this zoning and planning commission to allow personal solar but not utility solar. Solar on the roof is safe, but solar on the ground is not. That doesn't make sense. Let's consider, consider the differences in rooftop solar and utility solar on privately owned farmland. Number one, the number of panels. A rooftop may only be able to have 10 panels, while as stated on Tuesday, some of the farms that already have solar projects have six to 800,000 panels. It should be noted that these panels are the same type of panels as previously stated, photovoltaic. Number two, panel size. Solar panels on rooftops and panels used for utility solar projects require different structures for mounting due to the increased size of the utility solar panel. Number three, sunlight conditions. If sunlight conditions are exactly the same for both rooftop and utility solar on farmland, the only difference will be the system productivity. By this, I mean rooftop systems only have the tilt and orientation of the roof, and the array is limited to the roof slope. While ground mounted systems have sun tracking devices which lead to an increased energy production because they are able to follow the sun all day long. PV panels use both indirect and direct sunlight to generate electrical power. This means they are still productive on cloudy days. Granted, the energy generated on a cloudy day is less, but it is still working. Now to answer some of Ms. Walters' questions and to ask a few logical ones of my own. Ms. Walters asked about the process of finding and removing a damaged panel. If panels break on a roof, will the homeowner know? Are they climbing up the ladder to look at them every week or every month? Logically, if someone has been hired to manage and monitor the grounds of a project and the solar panels themselves, they are more likely to find the breakage and begin the process of either repair or removal and replacement which also, logically, if we were any productive business, which these companies so obviously are, the process of replacing a panel is going to happen immediately, as the developer for Athiona, Austin Roach, previously has stated. <coughs> as an educated woman, it appears to me that the people in this room can continue to raise concerns that are all easily answered by multiple accredited universities, as well as top environmental news sites, which all have science-based content are just burying their head in the sand when it comes to why solar should come to Mason County and all the benefits it would bring. Please, bring solar to Mason County. Don't shut the door on progress for my future. Thank you, Michaela. At this time, we'll have Elise McCabe come and speak, and after her will be Marion Miller. is Elise McCabe and I live at 6080 Helena Road in Mays Lick. I graduated from Mason County High School in 2018 at the top of my class. I received a full ride to North Carolina State University, the top university in the country for my field, an accomplishment which our school system can take no credit for. The average ACT score in my graduating class was a 16, a score four points below the state average and five below the national average. Many of our top students opt out of taking classes at MCHS, choosing instead to take classes through local universities to ensure they have a fighting chance of success after high school. My point here is that our school system is failing us. Most of our top talent has left for Lexington, Bowling Green, Virginia, North Carolina, Texas, you get the point. Their recruitment efforts include better job opportunities, higher incomes, more housing, which is in better condition, the condition of our public spaces, better public school systems, the list goes on. We can af cannot afford to come back here. The fact of the matter is that our economy and our society has changed. Our once prosperous town is falling apart. We've lost so much industry in the past 20 years, and I'm sure you've all heard we are slated to lose more within the next two. We have before us an incredible opportunity to bring back some of the life to Mason County, 
replacing revenue lost from tobacco and dairy with a completely new industry, one that will cause a ripple effect when it comes to business in Mason County. New industries and new jobs will follow. If we continue to deny industry and these incredible opportunities ahead of us, the youth of our town will be forced out to be able to feed our families. Look around. How many people in this room are below the age of 25? It's proof that it may be time to change something. Young people want to bring about change. We want to see our country prosper with new opportunities and new outlooks on the things that really matter. The world is changing and the march of time never stops. Someday, someday my gen generation will be in the position of leadership, power, and responsibility. I believe we should embrace change now and save our county before it's too late, before we let every industry leave us and we're paved over like our neighbor Millersburg. Let the emotions settle and you'll see that the reality of the situation is that the land belongs to the farmers. Give us the chance to choose. Do the real research yourself. Forget the opinion blogs and the social media lies. Let the light in and see what grows. I want it to be known that Blake Boyd claimed that 36,000 pounds of, car are, of carbon are sequestered by an acre of corn. This is incorrect. The Michigan State study states that it is 36,000 pounds of carbon dioxide, two very different things. It does not take a chemist to know this. I beg you, do the research yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I mean, thank you, Lisa. I'm sorry, I got to have myself. Next will be Mary Miller, and after her will be Joyce Duckham. I believe it's what it says. My name is Mary Miller, and I live at 5302 Lake and Pike, Maislick, Kentucky. I never dreamed that when my husband and I signed up to be a solar farm, that we would uh, be told, no, you cannot do what you want with your own property. I think back a few years ago when a subdivision was established on the, what we used to call the Turner Farm, which is connected to my property line. And I will be honest, I was not happy about that and about the changes that were going to be made next to my home. When we talk about someone's view changed, mine sure did. I went from seeing acres and acres of farmland and trees to seeing many homes that have been built on that land. That land will never be farmed again. But my farm, hopefully, someone will come and farm that and the solar panels are gone and have been taken up. When I hear talk about the roads being used to transport equipment that will be needed to build our solar farm, well, we allow the, those vehicles and many vehicles to travel those same roads to bring in supplies needed to build the homes that are located at that subdivision. I was concerned at the time of all the changes that were being made to my area and to my view. But you know what? That landowner who bought that Turner farm was allowed to sell that farmland piece by piece. And that was their right to do so. That was their land. I can say for the most part, with all the changes made to the Turner Farm, I can say for the most part, I have some wonderful neighbors that live next to me. I have lived on our farm for over 30 years, raised my children there, and my husband and I would never allow something on our land that we believe would destroy or harm our land, our family, or our neighbors. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. And next is uh, Joyce Duncan, is that right? Okay, and after Joyce will be Jeff Martin. My name is Joyce Duncan, and I live at 5317 Raven Road, Mason. And I'm here to speak about property value impact. Developers quote studies that show homes surrounded by solar panels, panels do not lose value. They claim that screening plans will soften the visual impact to such an extent that the solar installation will not be noticeable. Apparently, the PSC has allowed five years for the screening to mature. But what if someone wants to sell before the screening grows in? Or what about the properties on a higher value elevation and a second floor window with views of, with an unpeated outlook over solar panels stretching for miles? How much value does a pleasing view add to a home? 
an open view of fields and woods is much more desirable than solar panels and chain link fences. <coughs> a few shrubs won't change that. Very few people will pay full price for a home in the middle of an industrial solar development. Mary Kay is a Kentucky real estate appraiser specializing in eminent domain and in environmental damage studies. In response to a request from Senator Paul Hornback, chairman of the Agricultural Committee, she provided a summary chart of examples of diminution in property value as a result of proximity to utility scale solar installations. The letter is part of the public record, and this is a small sample of her findings. 2021, Spotsylvania Solar, Virginia, analysis of five single lot sales. Those adjoining the solar installation sold for 30% less than those that did not adjoin. 2021, Sunshine Farms, North Carolina, analysis of 13 vacant lot sales from a subdivision that abuts the solar installation. Lots adjoining the solar installation sold for 15.5% less than lots that did not. 2021, North Star Solar, Minnesota, analysis of seven adjoining properties purchased by North Star PV LLC. A sale resale analysis indicated a reduction in value of between 6.3% to 28% with an average decline of 16.8%. At this point, I'd like to show everyone what a 50-foot 50, 50 setback is. There are many form, farms in the county owned by families that might be interested in subdividing land to the developer homes and buildings for the next generation. With such a small setback of 35 to 50 feet, it could impair those farms from possibly being developed. Solar developers claim that there will be no negative impact on property prices. A property value guarantee is a fair way to back that claim up. No damage, no payout. Franklin County commissioners have recommended and written a PBG, and we can provide examples. And thank you for your time. I am not against solar, just individual solar. Industrial, no. Thank you, Joyce. At this time, we'll have Jeff Martin come to speak, and after Jeff will be Earl A. Jones. Good evening. My name is Jeff Martin. I reside at 6210 Parker Lane. I am a mechanical engineer with 40 years of experience in electric power generation. For the past 20 years, I have worked in the renewable and electric energy generation sector. Fact-based and common sense analysis of the positive impacts versus the detrimental impacts of the proposed industrial solar projects quickly leads one to the conclusion that the detrimental impacts far outweigh the positive impacts. And large-scale industrial solar does not belong on prime farmland, following up specific negative fact-based impacts that have resulted in my objection to be raised and submitted. Solar power in its current form is a poor viable energy source. It is intermittent and disrupts the conventional methods of planning and daily operation of the electric grid. This can lead to system operators to curtail solar generation, reducing its economic and environmental benefits. The demonstrated life cycle of solar facilities projected to be more than, no more than 20 years. The 30-year life cycle being perpetrated is unproven. The expected capacity factor, this is important, of the solar facilities projected to be less than 20%. Maximum capacity of the solar panel occurs at solar noon, and the duration is short-lived and abruptly falls off. Here's the math. The annual length plate generation capacity of a 100 megawatt of installed solar panels equals 876,000 megawatt hours per year. With a 20% capacity factor, the expected average annual generation would be dropped to no greater than 175,200 megawatt hours per year. Current technology of utility scale panels experience a loss of 1 to 2% efficiency each year. The proposed industrial solar project will be subsidized with 30% your taxpayer dollars, and the solar industry is not economically viable without them. Solar developers' primary objective is to harvest tax dollars, not harvest energy from the sun. Solar relies on other electricity generators to provide the service they cannot, thus imposing those costs on the generators and the grid. Though the solar facilities do not pay these costs, we, the ratepayers, do. Subsidies have lowered out-of-pocket costs for renewable project developers, but have not led to similar savings for electricity ratepayers. 
Large amounts of land is required for utility scale solar projects. The large footprint has very low corresponding energy output, which equates to a very poor energy density. Energy density estimates for utility scale solar systems range from 5 to 10 acres per megawatt. For every 100 megawatts of installed solar panels, it will require 1,000 acres. It's egregious and environmentally irresponsible to desecrate a non-renewable natural resource of prime farmland in a manner that produces minimal and short-term benefit, then lying in waste and unfertile for future generations. Loss of this prime ag land will directly contribute to financial losses to local businesses that supply them with seed, fertilizer, hardware, lumber, equipment, etc., etc. Albert Einstein said this, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. I urge you not to repeat the insanity of supporting the use of tax dollars to mandate and subsidize solar power on prime ag land. It is not a worthwhile investment. Okay, that's three minutes. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Jeff. This time we'll have Earl e. Jones, and after Earl will be Elizabeth Berry. My name is Earl Blade Jones. Get closer, Earl. 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 Get real close. Right. Where's that? Josh, pivot it. Pivot it. Pivot it. Pivot it. Pivot it. My name is Earl Lee Jones. My address is 6074 Key Point, Maysville, Kentucky, 41056. This, this zoning and planning commission has been reviewed text amendment to an ordinance of, for solar power for over a year. Past county judge executive Joe Perford, God rest his soul, sent a draft with was to be considered before the end of 2020. There has been additional ordinance draft modified subject, subject throughout the 2021. Solar power in active has been discussed by our legislative 20, our body since 2019. This isn't new, this isn't a quick decision. A motoring is adjusted, constitutional, and showed like a leadership, and I want to suggest the Zoning and Planning Commission use the ordinance text submitted by Bill Marshall at this hearing. In this ordinance, the conditional use described on Tuesday night and proposed by Bill Marshall is the first step in protecting the neighbors and in the community. Part 14, 14, 414.08, page 10, set back. The text amendment is only the first step. The state setting board and then the board of adjustment locally will pro provide a future well-regulated requirement for the neighbors and adjacent property. The planning and the zoning board should not make decisions on screening, buffering. This is the role of, for the board of adjustment and the setting board. Don't overreach, keep it simple. My final point tonight, if you are against solar, you are against Mason County, right. Thank you, Earl. At this time, we'll have uh, Elizabeth Berry, and after Elizabeth, we'll have Chad Lee. State members of our JPC Physical Court. I am Elizabeth Berry, and I live at 5194 Raymond Road, Mays Lake, on a farm next to Axiota's filing address. Axiona's project map showed our farms inside the boundaries of their project. A Goldfinch project and open uh, records map showed lands on either side of our farm potentially included, as well as lands behind our neighbor's house directly across from our residence. A well-coordinated PR campaign would have you believe that our real concern is view, but that's only partially correct. 
As Speaker Tuesday and I rightfully expressed our concern about living with a derelict house next to her house in residence downtown Maysville. You can imagine our concern with the prospect of our forever homes being surrounded by one to two million derelict solar panels. Bonds are only as good as the solvency of bonding companies. We are, sorry, uh, <laughs> will you allow removal of existing trees? Will you allow a 50 foot setback to the first panel from roads and property lines? If these projects are not created appropriately, you will have left no room for runoff or remediation. Will environmental insurance pay for our damage? We are concerned about economic impact numbers not vetted through the fiscal court and comprehensive planning process. We've heard numbers that range from 14 to 24 million, a billion in dollars in payroll. Here's my stat of this. Assuming a contract is sold at least of $650 per acre, a commercial tax base base might be 92.86 per acre. And at the county's tax rate, that would be roughly 100 in taxes per acre, times that by the 6,000 acres, the flyer circulating convention for three projects, I get roughly $600,000 in property taxes generated by the projects. These potential taxes would only be 2.5% of our annual fiscal revenue per year. Like the property taxes we pay in this county, these get distributed to our tax districts helping to fund Mason County Schools, Library, Extension, and Health. Therefore, a reasonable proposed tax value estimate over a 25 life, year, life of the projects might be roughly 16 to 17 million. That is, unless the fiscal court decides to allow payment in lieu of taxes. A 20-year negotiated contract that could change those tax payments going to our districts, incentivizing industrial projects to locate here, possibly decreasing these received tax monies. The taxes paid could go down significantly, far less than the numbers being quoted. Also, last time I checked, the bulk of these projects will be in the county, not the city. Does Mason County even collect payroll taxes? How will projects offset a USDA reported farm income of seven million annually? What is the effect on farm-related payrolls, leases, businesses, banks, professional services, the economic benefits are not being fully considered or balanced against the liabilities and negative impacts to our county lands with little long-term jobs created. These are industrial projects and should be zoned industrial, not zoned by traditional use in ag lands. Thank you, Elon. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, this time, We'll have Chad Lee come, and after Chad speaks, we'll take a break. So, uh, my name is Chad Lee. I'm a resident of Mason Lake, uh, 6205 Thomasburg Mason Lake Road. Um, as, this is much as, or just as like many other people here, a uh, multi-generational family in Mason Lake. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, you for your service. This is the voice of Mason County. I want to also thank you for this opportunity to speak. And just like many others here, I'm not totally against solar. I'm just um, mainly against <laughs> industrial uh, merchant companies that are going to take out viable farm land. Um, the solar developers insist on a pilot, which is uh, payment in lieu of taxes. And basically, it's this payment instead of taxes. From all taxing entities in this, in this county, they will also pursue industrial revenue bonds, IRBs, from the county. IRBs are simply a municipal bond issued by the county on behalf of the solar developer's project. The IRBs raise capital to fund the development of the project. The revenue of the project generates repays the bond holder, thus placing much of the project risk in the county taxpayers. In addition, IRBs generate tax-free interest of income for these bond holders. So um, I have many just like to speak before me. I have a lot of questions about the um, these payments and lose. Um, and if there's X amount of acres that are meet uh, in the county, um, I, I see that if there's solar panels on um, say 40 40 percent of these uh, farms. Is that a potential? property tax base is going to be lost for the community. So it's, 
and also on, on the on the IRBs, the bonds, other collaterals on those on those bonds. So finally, and importantly, there is an obvious problem that's that's being ignored, and the problem is decommissioning. Ever wonder why these solar developers are not forthcoming and are very vague regarding their comprehensive decommissioning plan? It's because they don't want, don't have one and one they want nothing to do with liability decommissioning. Um, they may not be true. I've heard it. You know, like we we we've, we've heard there are plans. I just we would like to know what those plans are. And basically, are these a decommissioning plan or the are they an exit plan or, or escape plan? And we, we touch upon uh, how much these uh, panels are devalued over a certain period of time. And, and who's going to pay for that, especially if we lose property tax base? Um, the federal EPA considers dead photovoltaic panels a toxic waste. They cannot be simply tossed in the county landfill. They must be trapped to federally approved toxic waste sites and buried with suitable precautions and protocols. These costs are their norms. Give it that's three minutes. Thank you. At this time, we'll take a five minute break.
five minutes. Please return to your seat. Everyone, we're going to get started here in a second. And just a, another friendly reminder to please ensure that you're wearing a mask over your nose and your mouth. And also, I've been asked to remind you uh, to please ensure that your phone is, is at least on silent, if not off, so it doesn't disrupt the proceedings. Uh, if you might be escorted out if you don't follow either of those two uh, groups. Thank you. to out on 6205 Flemingsburg, Bays Lake Road. Um, I just want to call attention to some outcomes, and Mr. Martin eloquently uh, stated some of these in his speech as well, um, to some outcomes to commitment to large-scale, intermittent being the key word here, renewable energy. 
I'm going to go to Germany and then I'm going to come back to Mason County to, prove, um, to talk about a case study. Um, on October 1st, 2021, the German Civil Protection Office released an ad campaign, that was this year, this October, to notify people that they need to immediately take action on energy crisis preparation. Based on these official communications, blackouts are coming to Germany soon. Germany is the sixth most developed country in the world. Why can't it supply its own energy? The problem of limited electric power is not so solely a German phenomenon. We've seen that already happening in the United States. When you have a heavy reliance on intermittent wind and solar, it's hard to power the grid. So, um, at present, Germany relies on intermittent power for 44% 40, of its electric energy. Germany experienced an unusually cold winter and spring, which depleted its natural gas supplies. It relies heavily on natural gas. The gas markets are getting tighter. We've seen that at the pumps. We know that gas is increasing in price. And when you have hotter summers, your increased use of air conditioning also puts a tax on the current electric grid. Coal burning has increased to make up the shortfall in Germany, and now coal reserves have been depleted with no coal available to purchase and replenish the reserves. The end result is that intermittent renewables are unable to respond to additional energy needs during unseasonable cold and weather, hot weather events, which we're already seeing becoming very seasonal. The supply of the mismatch of supply and demand, coupled with a costly and unreliable transition to green power, has seen other European countries do the same in recent months, and we've seen it right here in the United States. We don't have to look very far to look at Texas's blackouts. California's energy problems, and Colorado's blackouts and stress on their grids. Energy demands quickly outpaced, in these cases, energy supply from the intermittent renewables of wind and solar, and the cold weather rendered many of these renewables an offer. So how does that impact Mason County? Well, the solar companies that are projected to come into and create solar farms are going to be selling their green credits. We have to store those somewhere, and it has to go somewhere, so it's going to Eastern Kentucky Power. Every time when the sun's out, it produces the energy, which means Eastern Kentucky Power has to slow its production of other energies in order to not overtax the grid with thermal loads. That means you slow down and then you have to ramp it back up at night. And just like running your own air conditioner at home, you know that's not efficient energy use. That creates a problem on the grid. It leads to inefficient performance and higher electric costs. Thank you for my time. Yes, I need your written papers, please. Uh, at this time, we'll have Danny Collins, and after Danny, we'll have Ernie Lee. Uh, my name is Daniel Glenn Collins. Danny, a little closer to your microphone, please. 6252 U.S. Highway 68 in Maysville, Kentucky. Can you hear me now? A little bit. All right. Uh, my comments are specifically to the proposed ordinance and the application procedure. There are two elements in it that I'd like to mention. One is the, uh, one is that there is a, a wildlife, item 15 in the application procedure is to a directive to identify I would like to add to item 15 in the directive to identify, preserve, and create or create wildlife corridors in the solar energy system. Uh, that's a reference to the Kentucky Department of Wildlife to be involved in the proposal. Another is that I would like to add another item to item 19 for a hydrological study, which is a statistical analysis where they predict the effect of the development in the watershed. Uh, one of the basic ones would be like a, in a municipal area, trying to judge the need for storm sewer to handle runoff rain. This would be something that they could do by reviewing the plans that are made and predict flooding events in the future, whether it's an increased potential flooding events. And that's it. Thank you, Danny. Um, Ernie Lee, if you would come, and then Michael Berry will be after him. Hello, my name is Ernie Lee. 
that is 6205 Flemish Bird Maze Lick Road. In Maze Lick, I want to thank you guys for your service to the citizens of Maze <coughs> County and give me the opportunity to speak to them. I strongly oppose the construction of utility scale merchant solar electric generator facilities and prime agricultural farming. Mason County is under siege by several out-of-state and well-funded developers. These developers have placed nearly 10,000 acres of prime agricultural farmland under contract with industrial solar development with a goal to develop up to 25,000 acres. Mainly government policies rather than market forces are driving their mission. Policy makers continue to favor the solar industry with re renewable mandates and subsidies because they know the solar industry is, is not economically doable without them. The developers have built many local allies for the projects over the past two or three years. Several of our powerful public and private leaders are now supporting industrial solar. You know who you are. Commissioners, you are now at a point of decision regarding the, the future of Mason County prime farmers. Will your decision be based on ethics or politics? We don't want Mason County to become another Muhlenberg County where the town of Paradise was lost to the progress of man. The Kentucky Constitution Committee Citizens Resource Guide on large-scale merchant solar states the following. Where possible, avoid land identified by the Natural Resource Conservation Service as prime farmland or farmlands of statewide importance. Preferences are to reduce previously developed, disturb the greater or marginally productive portions of property. I'm asking that the leaders of Mason County to place importance on land ethics when considering the new solar energy system ordinance and use land already affected by previous development for locating large scale merchant solar facilities such as brownfields, rooftops, etc. Also, Kentucky should also consider that many thousands of acres, <coughs> hundreds of thousands, excuse me, hundreds of thousands of acres on abandoned strip mines. Large-scale merchant solar facilities do not belong on Mason County prime agricultural farmland. Thank you. Thank you, Ernie. At this time, we'll have Michael Berry come to speak, and after Michael will be John Ford. such as solar panels, 
um, the ground area to absorb water is reduced. Storm water rises to our streams quickly, resulting in the possibility of flooding. The desire to place solar panels 50 feet from our property line and from the roads will limit the ability for any type of water runoff control. Furthermore, our area is known for a large amount of rain fall in a very short amount of time. This is clearly illustrated by the recent flooding in both Maysville and Carlisle. Our farm shares a creek with a farm uh, contract for industrial solar. The proposed project would proceed as planned. We may lose land and fencing near the creek area. I question who is responsible for the refencing of the large border section of our family farm. What will be the impact on other areas in the county already prone to flooding, such as the North Fork? The EPA believes that runoff is of great consideration. In recent history, the EPA imposed mandates of hundreds of million dollars to, to Fayette County because of inappropriate urban zoning planning. All right. Also, decommissioning is also complicated because these panels contain cadmium and lead, as already discussed tonight. There is no place in Kentucky to take these panels at this time. We are only left with a possibility of a, a promise of a possibility of new industries being developed to take care of these two million panels. Solar waste will explode in the next two to three decades. The world will have 78 million metric tons of solar waste by the year 2050. Regardless of any decommissioning plan, Mason County could be stuck with these panels for a very long period of time. I question who is responsible for decommissioning and water runoff if the solar companies are no longer around in the future? What damage will our county neighbors uh, and loan owners incur from the water runoff? One yes, other concern yes, is yes, three minutes. Thank you, Michael. You need to bring your paperwork over to the recorder, please. At this time, we'll have John Ford, and after John will be Tom Fetter. Good evening. My name is John Ford. I live at 6082 Fort Acres Farm Road in Maysville. And I am in favor of a well-regulated solar array in Mason County. And I'll tell you why. The economic benefits are obvious. Tax revenue to the county be significant. It's going to help everybody one way or another. But the environmental impact is at least as important as the economic from a local perspective, the land under a solar array is basically laying fallow, which is the best and most economical way to build soil health. Looking at it from a worldview, we can do our small part in minimizing the effects of burning fossil fuels. There are very few second chances in life. This is an opportunity to improve the lives of everybody in Mason County. We can't let that slip by. These people aren't going to come back. I understand the opposition to solar. There's always pushback against anything new and different. Change is a little scary. Most arguments against solar are not supported by facts. The visual impacts, in my opinion, are the only valid reason for not putting in solar panels, and these can be mitigated with screening and setbacks. But please, I implore you, don't throw the baby out with the bash with bath water. Don't make the ordinance so onious that the solar companies walk away. You are making decisions that affect us, our children, and our children's children. Your job is to act in the best interest of the community as a whole. The best you can hope for is to make everybody just a little mad. You know, emotions have run pretty high on this issue. There have been instances of property damage. People are getting agitated. The longer this pot stays on the stove, the more likely it is to boil over. 
There's been plenty of time to gather all relevant facts. We have had enough delay and obfuscation. Please write the ordinance and let's move on. It's time to let the entrepreneurs and innovators lead us into the future. Thank you for your time. Good luck. And I commend you on your fortitude. My eyes glazed over listening to all this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, John. At this time, we'll have Tom Vetter come to speak. And after Tom, will be Rebecca Fontes. Thank you. My name is Tom Vetter. I live at 925 East 2nd Street. Uh, <clears throat> my wife and I have lived in downtown Maysville for nearly 40 years. I'm thrilled to hear that Mason County has the authority and power to guarantee that our property value will never go down. And even better, that we can dictate to our neighbors what they do with their property. I brought a list of what I consider to be the dozen ugliest properties in downtown Maysville. Boy, turn that in. Just kidding. That's silly. We all use electricity. Now we have a choice. EKPC produces approximately 240,000 tons, tons of toxic coal ash each year, 8 million tons of CO2, 38,000 tons of sulfur dioxide, and 300 tons of poisonous mercury. Solar panels do not pollute. They don't leach heavy metals into the ground. They're relatively quiet, and they're pretty to look at, in my humble opinion. EKPC's pollution has been estimated to be responsible for 76 deaths, 120 heart attacks, and 1,200 asthma attacks per year. Solar panels have not been shown to kill anyone. Solar panels do not poison the groundwater, contrary to what we've heard tonight, whereas EKPC has already been shown to contaminate groundwater. We've, I don't know about the, uh, the installations in Mason County, but it is perfectly possible to raise livestock and crops alongside solar panels, and it's being done in various places all over the world. So saying that farmland is destroyed is simply false. And most importantly, at least to me, what right does Mason County have to deprive local landowners of their property rights? I hear a lot of talk about communism on social media, but I never believed it would come to Mason County. I keep hearing about industrial solar, as if industrial is a bad word. Mesa County has a long history of industrial tobacco, industrial hemp, and industrial dairy, not to mention industrial gear and industrial paper manufacturing. Will you ban that too so we can all enjoy the sight of nature as God intended? Heck, tractors are industrial too. Are we going back to horses? Lastly, what is the average age of Mason County farmers? 55, 60? Who do you think is going to buy your farms if they don't generate income? It'll be Bill Gates and the 1% who buy it, just like they're doing everywhere else. Will they care about your local values? Please, commissioners, vote for this important addition to Mason County. Thank you, Tom. At this time, we'll have Rebecca Fonta speak, and after her will be Pam Trivi. Good evening. My name is Rebecca Fonts. I live at 5362 Leighton Pike in Lake. Thank you for this opportunity to share our opinions with you tonight. We moved here about 10 years ago and have been profoundly grateful to live in such a wonderful place. We purchased our home as much for its location, nestled in an agricultural area, as for any other reason. It saddens me as a relative newcomer to see longtime and lifelong residents who take both the beauty and protect, productive potential of this area for granted. Converting these tracts from agricultural use to industrial solar generation seems a poor choice if the goal is actually the production of electricity, 
given how much land exists elsewhere that is not farmable and is far sunnier on more days of the year. I'll not spend all my brief time here on whether the creation of these industrial solar facilities is a wise use of taxpayer dollars. I just ask you to recognize that these companies aren't here for well-intentioned, high-minded reasons. They are here to collect government subsidies that are paid for by your tax dollars and mine. And, of course, by the debt our government continues to accrue. We heard self-congratulating remarks on Tuesday about these companies having spent money for lunches at local businesses and participating in local charity events. I submit to you that all these activities are transitory. They are the actions of one wooing the beauty queen. Once they get what they want, they are not going to respect us in the morning. Your purpose in holding this hearing is to accept public input on this ordinance. So here is mine. I beg you, as you proceed in this task, to accept nothing, not one word, spoken by these companies as reliable. Create this ordinance to ensure that future transfers of facility ownership cannot result in failure to maintain and ultimately decommission facilities that are built. Please insist upon the highest possible levels of insurance against environmental degradation, pollution, and property value declines. Require cash escrow that cannot be refunded to these companies unless and until decommissioning is completed according to a standard well defined by you. Protect both the citizens who remain skeptical of vague corporate promises of benefits and the landowners who will not have farmland but wasteland at the end of these facilities' lives if the promises made by these companies are not enforced. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, and may God grant you wisdom in your deliberations. Thank you, Rebecca. At this time, we'll have Pam Trivi come to speak, and after Pam, will be Owen Brown. Of our watersheds, 
stating development is taking place without adequate attention being paid to drainage, flooding, and soil erosion concerns. Also, inadequate infrastructure in rural areas, noting that our county road system is inadequate to meet the needs of significant development. The plan also notes the most intensive land use changes should occur in and around the city of Maysville, where the required level of public services and infrastructure are found and that limited development in selected rural communities would largely consist of convenience-type businesses and single-family residences. The directions, our comprehensive plan, well, it has very little meaning if it's not implemented. The plan also states, action without direction will result in poor decision-making on the part of government officials. That's three minutes. Thank you, Pam. At this time, we'll have Owen Brown come to speak, and after Owen, will be Dave Loney. Good evening, everybody. So my name is Owen Brown, 6173 Helena Road, Mays Lake, and I'd like to thank the committee for organising this public hearing and listening to our concerns. Thank you. Okay, my topic is industrial solar and noise. Noise can be defined as any unpleasant or unwanted sound that is unintentionally added to a desired sound or environment. ASEAN Solar carried out a noise study as part of a construction application in Fleming County. The study predicted that there would be 24 decibels of project noise. I'm about to explain what that means. Um, 24 decibels of project noise above background sound levels at the Hunter Trace subdivision in Fleming County off 32. Now, noise at this level I don't think is widespread in a, in a solar facility, and the problem here is caused by the fact, in my opinion, I don't particularly know, that this subdivision projects into you know, the project area from 32, so that it's, it's difficult for them to keep the inverters away as much as they might do in other circumstances. Anyway, according to this study conducted by SWCA for Asiona, 10 decibels represents a doubling of audible sound. It's very important to understand the log logarithmic effect, um, you know, when you're talking about uh, solar noise and decibels. So 10 decibels represents a doubling of the audible sound. 24 decibels, therefore, equals a quadrupling of the sound that you can hear. The sighting board described this as a dramatic change in baseline noise caused by operation of the proposed facility. I used a calibrated sound level meter to record the background natural sounds in my backyard on a calm summer evening. The meter reads 40 decibels and you can hear the birds singing. I then played a recording of solar inverter noise and increased its volume until the sound reached 50 decibels, 10 decibels of added noise. The intrusive inverter noise is both loud and annoying at just 5 decibels. Not all, not all noise is created equal. This particular sound is like listening to someone scratch their nails down a blackboard. Here we go. I don't know if this is... That's 40. This is no sound on this. Okay. Well, well, after this, this is three minutes. You need to have the sound on to hear it. Can we turn the sound on or not? Uh, 
right. Well, can, I mean, is, are you able to make the sound go? This, this, this sound's not on there. You're not, you're not hearing the sound. The sound's dramatic, but I don't think I'm going to be able to hear it and play it. Take it from me, five decibels above the background side of 40 was very loud and very annoying. 50 was unbearable. You want me to stop there? Okay. Thank you, Owen. Thank you. Sorry the technology didn't agree with you there, but then things happen. This time we'll have Dave Loney, and after Dave will be Sarah Winter. My name is Dave Loney. I live at 669 Gilcrest, Major. I will try and make a, a lot of things that have been said that I hate to cover again, but basically what I want to say is it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit Mason County. It doesn't fit the plan. Now, I would urge you to find the information, whether you agree with it or not, you have resources, good resources. You have George, you have uh, Attorney Clark, you have County Attorney's Office. They may have access. It seems like it has been impossible to get unbiased information. Now, maybe you've had more luck. But the reason I say that it doesn't fit is, first of all, I would say, or begin by saying, <laughs> It isn't agriculture. Agriculture is, in fact, the production of produce. A friend of mine once described agriculture as a creation of new wealth. The only time we can create new wealth is through agriculture. Solar is simply a transfer of wealth, a drastic transfer. Now, as we, as we look at this, I think we should look carefully at stormwater, water runoff, water retention, based on both the geology and the topography of Mason County. We need to have sufficient coverage for decommissioning and the history of reclamation in, in this state everywhere has been terrible. It should be the responsibility of the fiscal court, whoever it is, to hold the bonds, collect the money. Don't let a third party have it. Make sure that there's... Now, I would be remiss in not mentioning uh, <laughs> setback. Setback is not because of beauty. There's no way you're going to make these things any more ugly or any more beautiful. The reason that we need setback, and I will say this, a vehicle traveling 40 miles an hour covers 40 feet in one second. The reason, or what we should look at for setback, is actually the fencing was referred to last night, and they had it at cattle type. The reason for a setback and fencing and warning signs is very simply liability. Incidents happen. And when you go to court on an incident, the solar companies are going to say, Whoa, we did everything the county asked us to. The county's responsible. So please, deal with the attorneys. Try and reduce our exposure to liability as much as possible. I don't know where I'm at on time. That's your, your three minutes. I'm at 10. Thank you. Good luck. Good night. Thank you, Dave. At this time, we'll have Sarah Winter, and after Sarah will be Gerald Woods. Sarah's not here. Okay. Uh, Gerald Woods.
hear me? Okay. Gerald Woods, uh, 6115, Cliff Mike, I'm a first generation farmer in Mason County. So maybe I'm kind of new at this for the last 40 years. Um, thank you for the opportunity to address the board tonight. I just briefly want to share a few facts. I'm not a solar expert. I don't ever want to be a solar expert. But I wanted to touch on one item about property values. And so today, I logged into a website that the Schneider Corporation allows individuals to look at the Mason County Property Valuation Office for sales and figures and acres and dollars exchanged for those property sales. And I know there's no way to be sure how property values could be affected if a solar facility is located. But at the present time, a very high percentage, I found the only, uh, let me back up. I did a 20,000 foot search for the last 12 months, expanding from the Mazelik Baptist Church. So centrally located in Mazelik for 12 months. At the present time, I found one property that actually brought less money than it had from the previous owner that makes sense. Everything else had sold for higher money than the previous sale. And this was a master commissioner sale. One example is a real estate transaction that took place on 6149 Cliff Pike. It was a 1,776 foot square home with a finished garage and attached garage. It was purchased for 145,000 in 2013 and sold for 250 this past year. Another property at 6030 Flemingsburg Mays Lick Road consisted of 138 acres with a 2,579 square foot house it was sold in September for $270,000. It had sold in September of 20 for $650,000, an increase of $70,000. And one more property consisting of a 12 or 10 acre vacant lot on Helena Road, sold for $65,000 in February, having cost $51,000 in September, the year before. And all of these properties were purchased driving by solar and anti-solar signs. So I don't think the owners were blind to what was possibly in progress in Mason County. Mason County needs new business increase to increase our revenue for service, county government provides all of us on a daily basis. You have a choice to make to move Mason County forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Gerald. At this time, uh, we'll have Joe Sell. <laughs> I'm just reading what's down here. And, and the good news for the commission, we're getting ready to go to the last page. And uh, after Joe will be Mary Catherine Crocker. Good evening. My name is Joe Collins. I live at 6462 U.S. 68 in Bay State. I live with my wife, Lori, there. I have worked our family farm since graduating high school. My grandparents did farm this farm as did my dad, who is now 92 years old, and my mom, who is 83. And they all have farmed and made an honest, enjoyable living on this farm throughout their entire life. But each year, farming becomes a bigger challenge, not only from changing weather conditions, because there's no such thing as seasons anymore, <clears throat> but also the financial burden that our county finds itself in. The basic tools needed to farm, as well as seed and fertilizer prices, has skyrocketed in the last few years. And as much as I hate to admit it, age and health are always playing a huge part in the daily struggles of farming. There are many others here tonight that never went to college, never got public jobs, or never left the state. No, we chose to stay on our family farms and work day in and day out and are proud of what we have been, what we have accomplished doing so. 
and make no mistake about it, none of us that did this want or need sympathy. This is the life we chose and the life that we love. But it's time for us to start looking for other opportunities and to enjoy the benefits of hard work we have put in over the years. Our family was approached by National Grid over a year ago and was asked for a portion of our farm to be included in their solar project in May Slick. <clears throat> we are very particular with our land and strive daily to take the best possible care of what we do and what we can. And unlike what some folks will lead you to believe, we didn't open our back door barefoot early one morning and sign the clipboard we were handed by the solar company man just because we were offered money. No, we did months of research, talked to lawyers, spent sleepless nights thinking on this new endeavor that we were offered for the land that has been supported to us, supported us for generations. This is a choice we were given for the land that we own, and we know it is the right choice for us. There seems to be lots of opposition <clears throat> from folks in the area that have never farmed full time and in no way can know the daily struggles that farmers face to make ends meet. Yet, they want to tell us what we can and can't do <clears throat> with the land we own. Some people are more worried about what they are going to see when they drive by local farms instead of worrying about the future of the local farmer and his family. These solar companies will not hang around waiting. They will go right down the road to the next county and make them the same substantial money off substantial <clears throat> money offer. After well over a year of meetings that most everyone in this room on both sides of the debate has attended, it is past time for the board to act and put a fair, reasonable ordinance like the one presented Tuesday night by the pro solar members. <clears throat> if you choose that's not three minutes. To, that's three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Please leave your paperwork with the recorder, please. Would y'all make sure you please bring the best of it, please? <laughs> <laughs> this time we'll have Mary Catherine Cropper followed by Barbara Schwartz. Hello there. I am Mary Catherine Cropper. I reside at 5073 Raymond Road, Mason, Kentucky. And I don't have any great ideas for you tonight. You've already heard them, but I do have a solution. Buddy uh, and I have been stewards of the land. For many years, we set aside programs, farm programs. We planted vegetation for wildlife, which was his love for quail, duh. We utilized the best farming techniques that we could find to minimize, to minimize the land erosion. All of these have been employed over the years on our farm. I was one of the first that was approached for solar panels. My late husband, Buddy Cropper, and I purchased property in Mays Lake area over the 60-some years that we were married. My farm is comprised of 90-some acres, and this was ideal for installation of a solar farm. Because of my love for the farm and for my livelihood as well, and the environment, I did extensive research into the factors that many of, a, of the non-solar groups have mentioned. My research indicated solar panels are good for the environment. They release no harmful atmospheric emissions. They do not pollute land or water. The sun produces a continuous source of power. And there is no irritable noise pollution. The news constantly brings up global warming and the need to go green. Solar farming in Mason County will and could be a step in the right direction. We can help be a part of the change for the benefit of our present population and our future generations. The installation of the panels will not destroy the topsoil. And if they are in there for the 25 years, the soil remains dormant, as someone has mentioned here, and the land will rejuvenate from all of that corn raising that really takes uh, large, very large things from our vegetation. Uh, vegetation will be planted to support the animals and the birds in the area. And of my 900 acres, approximately 250 of them 
will be used to be, and be left for native plants and animals. My contract with the solar company does include money. It does include money set aside in case we have problems at the very beginning of the project. It's set aside for decommissioning the panels and returning the land for me to farm. Farming has been my love, been my husband's love, but I find solar farming a change and a change for the better. I thank you all and I would appreciate your support in helping Mason County go forward with green energy and use of solar farming. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Catherine. And at this time, we'll have uh, Barbara Schwartz come to speak, and after she speaks, we'll take a five-minute break. My name is Barbara Schwartz and I reside at 6205 Flemingsburg Maeslick Road, Maeslick, Kentucky. I would like to extend thanks to the committee for the opportunity to speak tonight. Citizens Voice of Mason County, Inc. is a 501c4 organization dedicated to advancing smart growth, enduring economic development, government transparency, and sound infrastructure in Maysville, Mason County. Citizens Voice employs the use of advocacy, education, and research. Through these efforts, we hope to achieve a prosperous and attractive community in the heart of our beautiful and productive bluegrass Appalachian landscape. Citizens Voice is about moving our special community and farms forward together, and in doing so, promoting what makes our home so very special. Citizens' Voice of Mason County is not an anti-organization. We have a long history of support in this community. School backpack programs, Mason County Animal Shelter, local road trash pickups, donations to the Negro School Fund, Maislick Fire Department, we're awareness supporters of FFA, Green Dot, Food Pantry, Emergency Management Services, Mason County Library, the Department of Tourism, Mason County Landfill, Mason County Police and Fire Departments, and the Kentucky Trust for Historic Preservation. The list is long. Our commitment is solid and has been respectful, honest, and exemplary in its passion for Mason County. Imagine how devastated we were to learn what was going on behind closed doors, keeping the community in the dark. If if this is so good for Maysville, Mason County, why keep citizens in the dark? That's three minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. At this time, we're going to recess. Barbara, please leave your... Oh, she already did? Okay, thank you. At this time, we'll have a five-minute recess. <laughs>
Please return to your seat so we can start again. Also, please be sure to be wearing your mask over your mouth and your nose. Says, if you'll do this for us, we'll pay in lieu of taxes some money 
to save the tangible. When I'm talking about $14 million for 6,000 acres over 30 years, I just forgot about the tangible. It's more money than the real estate is. When you get ready to choose, I would ask you to pick fact, not fear. Take logic, not emotion. If not solar, what are we going to do to change our trends? Please draft the regulation to let solar help us in our future. We like and we believe we have the ability to use solar to have a brighter future financially and ecologically for ourselves and for our community. Do not take our rights to protect the view of a few. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. At this time, uh, Paul Jackson will speak. After Paul will be Rebecca SK something or other. Anyway, Rebecca, you're after Paul Jackson. Okay, folks, thank you. Uh, I didn't know I was going to get to speak tonight, so I just kind of made observations from what I've seen what I've heard. Um, you know, we talked about tombstones, referring to solar panels. You know, we're getting ready to replace tombstones up and down the Ohio River. That's the power plants. Uh, we're lucky enough to be close to the grid here, which gives us the opportunity to feed into it. Um, as far as the energy transmission, it is cyclical. It goes up and comes down. Uh, as our power generators get more acclimated to it, uh, they'll be able to manage it. Uh, so it's just like this little thing that Tom got upset about. Mine is on silent. But 30 years ago, you had a bag and you stuck an antenna on the hood of your car to have a cell phone. You know, that's technology. This is what this is, this new technology. It's going worldwide. We're lucky enough to be in a position to take advantage of it. Uh, the, the financial benefits are significant. Uh, you know, we want, you know, we talk about smart growth. Right now, we got no growth. We're working our butts off to get growth. But when you do, when you look at the facts, the total hard facts, we're going downhill. Income per household, we're going downhill with our population. And these are Census Bureau's, 2020 Census Bureau facts. So, yeah, we want growth and we want smart growth, but at the same time, I don't see how we can afford to turn our backs on this opportunity. It's a temporary thing for the prime farmland. Everybody wants to talk about prime farmland. It's not going away. It's not being developed. Anytime you sell somebody five acres, 10 acres, that's not a farm, that's a tax exemption. They're running that game, so they put the farm tag on the pickup truck, and they're not farmers. Okay, the vast majority of the people that are pro-solar have farm, and that's their income. They do it for a living. The group that is not, as uh, one of my buddies in Maine looks at, they're just out there playing. Okay, so the topography we talk about, cars topography, I've I torn a tire off my tractor. You know, it's it's been there the whole time. It's going to continue to be there. All the 240D, Roundup, Dicambia, Liberty, all that stuff I spray to plant my crops, it goes right in those holes too. So we didn't leave because it's here. I mean, it's going to be here from now. Germany, we talked about they're having brown ice, black ice. The reason that came about is they shut all their nuclear plants down because of what happened in Japan. Remember when the tsunami hit? Germany decided, well, let's shut it all down. They did it to themselves. We can't blame renewables for that issue they have when, in fact, they shut their nukes down because there was an uproar over it, emotional uproar over it, and now they're struggling to generate power. Okay, and that's three minutes. minutes. Thank you very much. Y'all got a tough job. Thank you, Paul. Now, Rebecca, when you come and speak. And after Rebecca would be Jason Sheppard.
I'm Rebecca Shevick, and I reside at 62 on 3 Parker Lane, Mays Lake. In 2015, my life changed dramatically. My husband and I were afforded the opportunity to move to the great state of Kentucky. Family and friends expressed how lucky we were since it was such a beautiful state. What is Kentucky known but for vast horse farms, miles of wooden fences, historical stone walls, finest racetracks, bourbon, beautiful tobacco barns, historic towns, and rolling hills with farms on some of the best agricultural land in the country. A dream come true for horse enthusiasts. What did not enter our minds was the possibility of being surrounded by industrial solar installations. Upon buying property in Mays Lake in 2019, no word was ever mentioned that solar fields were in the works. Our realtor company had no notion of this. How can this not impact property value and resale value? Solar panels are not yet built to affect property value yet, just the intent. Is this corporate America claiming our land and destroying future use of it to be productive in the future? Seems like such a venture to benefit so few financially will ultimately negatively impact the majority of Mason County and Mays Lake residents with decreased property values. Many of these landowners with cash or checks and end up moving away, leaving their neighbors surrounded with these industrial eyesore. Fulfilling our vision with a private training farm, we never envisioned our foals growing up alongside solar panels. Training a sensitive animal with the additional 60 to 85 decibels of noise, added traffic and construction, and disturbances proves problematic. What is the long-term effects of livestock, like horses and cattle, grazing near these installations, with possible watershed and runoff of contaminants into the grazing fields and pastures nearby. From a lifetime of working with horses, they are known to be very sensitive to vibration, humming noise, and electric charge. Is this what we moved to Kentucky for? To see fields stripped of topsoil, concrete pillars sunk into the grounds at depths of up to 20 feet, and mineral rights taken over by these companies, which will negatively impact neighboring farms in the end. It's, these people seem to care that all rights to land and control are simply handed over to these companies. Why are mineral rights up for grabs? Mason County has a comprehensive plan for properly creating land use management ordinances, and this process needs to be carried out. I have seen firsthand what the ravages of strip mining can do. Many of the woods and fields I grew up on are stripped. The land, even after reclamation and topsoil was replaced, is never the same. Fields full of rock and shale and scant amounts of grass growth. Is this worth stripping our agricultural farm, grazing land of its fertile soil? And how can this land be productive again after 25 plus years of solar panel installations? Thank you, Rebecca. And uh, I didn't realize that um, Jason was your husband. I apologize for not pronouncing your name right. Uh, Jason, uh, okay, it's your turn to speak. And after Jason will be Jeff Dickerson. Good evening, my name is Jason Shepik. I reside at 6203 Parker Lane, Mason, Kentucky. I am going to revisit the Hillcrest site to discuss setbacks at 233 parcel of that installation versus a 20 acre parcel. Existing setbacks of 125 and 75 feet on this three-sided property. His horses now avoid the yellow outline section of the pasture since that system now has become generating electricity. They didn't mind the construction but because of the cognitive skills and smell and feel of energy sources, we know because we have a mayor that early on in life could open up the yellow handled gate. So we had the hot wire on top of it because we were trying to figure out why she was always out. He also stated that he has a loss of income. He is a certified gunsmith and repairs guns to test them out, but he can no longer shoot anymore because there's panels to the west, north, and east. He also can't shoot south because of Ohio State Route 286. 
However, the setbacks say that if it's 500 feet, he probably would have no loss of his use of land. But he's lost 19%, and that would be a 67% of the original 233 acres for solar energy generation. Next, I'd like to talk about RVs. Using data from lg and website and finding out more about RVs, the installation was around $17.7 million. Developers want to learn to like to do about 5% cash. So that's about 885,000 in this example. And then the rest of the local government would be on the balance of the 16.8 million. Using data from lg and Brown site, a 10 megawatt facility generates 45 megawatts a day. The price on the PJM index from uh, December through July was averaging about $35.10 per megawatt. So 45 times 365 times $35.10 $35 is paying gross of 578, dollars per year. A simple back of the envelope straight pay cal payback calculation indicates it takes 29 to 30 years. Sounds economically feasible. The developer is the most likely to get a huge tax credit. A 30% tax credit on $17.7 million is about $5.3 million. Next, I'd like to look at the weather today. That's the instability of the create on the beautiful day in Kentucky. Two, what does the Exxon Mobile expert say? For forecasts for 2019 indicate that wind and solar, while needed to help fight carbon, is not going to help us supply our energy demands. Our plant that I work at looked at this a few years ago. It was a $1.2 million investment. Exxon Mobile, and um, it was just to keep the lights on. It can't generate the power to run the plant that I work in. Oil and gas, and combined with renewables, is the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. At this time, we'll have uh, Jeff Dickerson come to speak, and after Jeff will be Melanie Hawk. I think Mr. Dickerson had to leave. Okay. Okay, um, so that would be <coughs> Melanie Hawk, is she here? Okay, and after Melanie would be Clint Stone. Stand a little closer, closer to the mic, please. Thank you. Is that better? <laughs> Sorry. My name is Melanie Hawk. I reside at 5129 Franklin Road, Hillsboro, Ohio. I am a landowner in that said beautiful solar farm of Hillcrest. I understand you guys have got a job to do here, and I hope that you were given all the tools, and I know after reviewing what Mr. Marshall has given you, you have a great tool there to complete your job at hand. I had a speech all lined up, prepared, practice it, and practice it, unfortunately. Solar is so new and different to our area, not everyone goes embracing change. It is our human nature to be afraid of change because it's something that is unknown. You shouldn't be afraid of growth, however. You have the Kentucky Model Solar Ordinance 2.2 given to you by the, wrote by the Kentucky Resource Council given to you by Mr. Marshall. Use this as an unbiased instruction manual as your guide to embrace this opportunity that is here in your community right now. I advise you to embrace the pilot payments as to those payments go directly to those entities. Thus will not affect the tax revenue as stated by your school financial officer earlier this evening. That only happens if you want to tax the solar companies and the property value that they are putting in with all that infrastructure and the billions of dollars 
that they are willing to invest here into this community right now. Guys, if you had a $100 bill laying on that floor, how many of you here will walk by that $100? Not very many of us, I'm sure. You guys have billions of dollars right here at your hands. Are you going to drop it? Walk away from it? I understand the tax revenue is not here anymore with tobacco. I was a tobacco farmer. I've been doing tobacco helping with that since I was three years old. It was my job to pull the tips. I understand what is here at hand and what this community has at stake. I advise you to embrace those pilot programs and run with them because that is the best investment for this community. You've talked about these projects taking tens of thousands of acres of prime farm ground. Who here has designated that as prime farm ground? Who's been out here working those soils and mending those soils to do the best thing that they can do with what they have at hand? I myself is a fifth generation farmer married to a sixth generation farmer. And we have had to implement new practices new technology of mapping from our combine to tell us where the yields are higher, where the yields are lower, so that we know where we can come back with our computerized mapping system, with our specialized fertilizer spreader to highly regulate the fertilizer in those spaces that it's needed. That's three minutes. It's the same thing you have here tonight. Any questions? Since I am a landowner, does anybody from the board have any questions? Thank you, Melanie. Okay. At this time, we'll have a clean stone. And after Clint will be Taylor Saunders. I want to thank you for y'all's time. It's late, and uh, I know everybody's wanting to go home and everything. But I just want to introduce myself. My name's Clint Stone. I uh, am a teacher at MCIS here in Mason County. I have been teaching here since 2005. I've serviced over 3,000 of your, I've serviced over 3,000 of your children, grandchildren, great grandchildren. I'm an art teacher. Uh, we came up here uh, in 2005, but we didn't move up here until about 2012. We would come up this way from Carlisle. We bought a small house there, and I was working at school system since 2000. And uh, but we fell in love with the area. We looked downtown, and even though my wife and my brother probably lived downtown at the time, we loved the beauty out there in Mays Lick. I live at 6048 Metcalf Mill, kind of around the corner off Nepton a little bit. You can see us from 68, but we're very close to where some of these uh, uh, panels will be put. And if we had known, and if we had known that those were a possibility, we would have never spent the 300 plus thousand dollars to buy that very expensive property and build that. The only home that really we, I mean, that's, that's the dream home that we wanted. I find it insulting that anybody would expect me to spend my taxpayers' money to depreciate the cost and the worth of my property. I find that insulting. I'm, I'm all about solar, I get it. I've got solar lights all over my house, but that's where they belong. They love on my home. On Long out there, 7,000, 10,000 square acres of our best agricultural property we have in this county. We couldn't believe it. We went out there and we dug five feet. We did hit a pub. Carlisle, 16 inches. Couldn't grow anything out there. And we just, and we have a, we have a small business up here at the uh, Mason uh, Family uh, Drug Store. We have a small cafe family owned, we uh, have put about, we've sold $400,000, $500,000 worth of product in the, uh, in the community here. We have a garden, we have our own bees, we make our own yogurt. We have, it feeds the uh, cafe, saves on cost. Uh, average, I've only made $35,000 a year you know, since I started, I've been teaching about 31 years. Getting ready to retire, go back out to my 10 acres, and those are beautiful. I love every square inch of that. So I understand what it is to be a landowner. 
I'm new at it. My people came from Eastern Kentucky, lost all their land due to the coal mines. I know it. Go up to Amber and Sassafras Hollow, and my families owned all that mountaintop, and they removed all of it, and they destroyed. These big companies, you've got to be really careful with them. It's, for them, it's all about the money. And maybe for some of us, that looks pretty good for us, too. But you can't desecrate the area around you for a profit. I can't build whatever I want to out of my, my, my land. I can't open up a gentleman's parlor because of zoning. And that's why we live out in the country. We chose the area because of the zoning. Because we knew that it was the countryside. My father was very proud when he came out. He never thought he'd have a child and would own 10 acres. That's three minutes. I appreciate that. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Clint. This time we'll have Taylor Saunders, and after Taylor, we'll have Chris Cropper. <coughs> Can you guys hear me okay? Is that all right? All right, my name is Taylor Saunders. I'm a farmer and landowner. My farm is at 4129, Kentucky 596, Mays Lake. I uh, probably don't have a whole lot of elegant words tonight. I'm not much of a public speaker. But I, I wasn't really planning on speaking, but I just wanted to provide maybe a different viewpoint from what we've been hearing tonight. Uh, a young farmer that is pro solar. I guess I was very blessed that I graduated from Warhead State in 2018 with a degree in agriculture. And I come back home to the farm with my dad and brother. Currently, our farm is a uh, our operations feeding three families, me, my dad, my brother. And, uh, you know, it mainly consists of buying and cattle. Everybody's been saying the back is on the way out. Well, it might be, it might not be. We, <laughs> it's not up to us. And we'll probably keep growing because we don't have any sense to do otherwise. But uh, I guess what I'm saying, too, is we, uh, it's not a way out for us, solar panels aren't. It's not something that's going to make us quit farming. Uh, we have a passion for it. Uh, we're young, we want to do it for years to come. Uh, we just signed up a small portion of our family land for it. It's not something that's going to take over every acre we own. We're going to keep growing tobacco, keep raising cattle, keep doing what we can. And uh, I don't want to be stereo stereotyped into saying that we're not profitable anymore because we do tobacco and cattle. Times are hard, but we're still able to make profitable because we are like with some of the other young farmers that have learned how to sprinkle the technology and uh, different methods of farming in order to stay profitable. We've gotten into small square bells of alfalfa trying to sell it to horse customers. We call it everywhere from Louisville to Ashland. I mean, we just try to do everything we can. And uh, we're going to continue to do that. I just think solar panels will be something to diversify our operation. Like I said, a small percentage of it. Maybe add on, add on to the money we're making off everything else. I don't, I mean, we live out in the middle of nowhere pretty much. Well, we signed up, nobody can see. If they can see it, they're also signed up. So I, I never dreamed whenever they come in and offered, you know, this uh, opportunity, they would be a rich community. Uh, I didn't see that coming. You know, I, I genuinely hate that, uh, that there is a rich community. I got friends on both sides of it, people I respect, people that have done a great job farming. And on both sides of it. And tonight, I'd just like to ask you guys to make a, a swift decision and uh, maybe just at the end of the day, I guess what I think is maybe just let a farmer decide for themselves what's best for their land and what's going to work out for them and help them take their farm land. I really appreciate you guys this time. I know it's late. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. This time we'll have Chris Cropper, and after Chris Cropper, we'll have C.J. Hunter the fourth. My name is Chris Cropper. 5140 Main Street, Main Lake. And uh, agriculture is still a strong economy here in the county. It's the foundation of this county. Everything, everybody's affected by it. There's a lot of good farmers in this room. Farmers have been good to everybody that's here. One way or another, farmers help everybody. We got new businesses here. Right there from my house, within 30 minutes, I can drive to my house <coughs> and get a bike corner. Six stockyards is within an hour of where I live. The farmers of uh, agriculture and farmers of big business. We've got the Enviroflight out here just come in. 
using 80 ton of grain a week. It's going to be a high demand for grain. And it's mostly local grain. I'll be glad, like Clay said, when this is over. I don't know what kind of decision needs to be made. But the decision that agriculture is a bad, non profitable business, that's not true. Agriculture is still as strong as it's ever been, and it'll probably get stronger. I feel like this committee's got a more important decision to make tonight that it needs attention immediately. And I hope you all, I hope it's over and the things that the community comes back together like it ought to be. Thank you very much, Chris. At this time, we'll have C.J. Hunter the fourth, and after him will be F. Andrew Matheny. I'm C.J. Hunter, and I live on Indian Spring Farm near Washington. My family residence is 4045 U.S. 62. My family has been a part of the Mason County agricultural community since 1780. My ancestors raised the first crop of wheat in Mason County in 1784. We have a long tradition of farming. My comments tonight are not for or against solar energy in general. Rather, that Mason County has policies in place to protect our community and a policy for future generations that will view as both protected and forward thinking. Our standards should not favor a particular short-term financial gain for some, but be a process that protects and allows growth for the future of Mason County. I have lots of questions, and I have lots of bad answers, don't we? But one of my major questions is the liability issue. What is really the liability issue of the farmers, or even Mason County Fiscal Court later on? Why are industrial solar companies not purchasing the land? Could it be a concern for the decommissioning, the liability, the watershed issues of solar panels after they're obsolete, damaged, or not in use? I don't know. I have questions. I know farming has a very American tradition and nostalgic point of reference. And if we say or read a statement long enough, the perception has to be true. I've heard many friends and landowners say, it's my land. That is true. But if you live in Mason County, we have zoning restrictions. And if you are a business as a farmer, you're dealing with the farm regulation, both on federal and state level, from the Farm Service Agency and USDA for standards for your particular operation. The quote, do whatever you like days in this county have passed several years ago. Mason County farmland is also one of our local tourism's most commented on attractions and features of the growing ag tourism in Kentucky. I deal with this often. Our visitors continue to be impressed by Mason County and support the many businesses. They're not coming to Mason County to view solar panels. I checked today with the tourism office. Do you realize that we have almost 500 people directly employed by tourism? The revenue in 2019 was estimated a little under $50 million. Tourism is a big part of our economy. Do not destroy our pastoral settings and major tourism draws to appease the financial driven comments. Select properties for solar with care and make sure the setbacks are protected and not just a minimum level between properties and most importantly our roads. Take time to research, reflect, and find out from other areas concerning industrial solar projects that are similar in size, similar in agricultural scope, and topography. That's three Please minutes. question, and let me end with this. Truth is not mine being challenged, being questioned. A lie is not like being challenged. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. This time we'll have Andrew Matheny. Steve Jane. Okay, after Andrew Matheny, I have T. 
Keith Gifford. I'm Andrew Matheny, uh, reside with my wife and family at 6706 U.S. 68 in Kentucky. And if you look in the dictionary, Webster defines an experiment as a procedure undertaken to make a discovery. That's what we're talking about here with solar panels in Mason County. We're under, you want to undergo a procedure to make a discovery. There has never been, in an area like ours, a large-scale solar development. I think we've got one in Ohio just north of us that's in the 1,000 to 1,500 acre range. From the estimates I've heard from the solar folks, we're talking upwards of 10,000 acres. Do we really want Mason County to be part of an experiment to see what 10,000 acres of solar panels does to an urban and a rural community that's heavily populated? We can talk about the farms all we want to. And this is not West Texas, it's not Western Oklahoma, it's not Wyoming or Montana, where your neighbor is 20 miles down the road and you see them at church on Sunday. Everyone in here that owns land, myself included, can look out across our farms and we can see a house. Someone's residence, someone's livelihood, their place of business. Farms are a place of business. Do we want that to be an experiment. You're asking for an experiment to be conducted that we don't know the outcome of for 20 years down the road. What happens when the windstorm comes through or something bad happens and solar panels have to be destroyed? Do they go to the Mason County landfill? Do we have those chemicals leaching out in our landfill, into our ground? And a lot of the solar folks have said, and I agree, if it's your farm, you should do with it what you want. But the caveat to that is, and we've got a neighbor that doesn't spray his pastures, he only weed eats once a year, or bush hogs once a year, so therefore my family spends quite a bit of money doing weed control in our pastures for our cattle to be able to graze. So when what they do with their land becomes my problem, it's costing my family money. And we all are in this business to make money. If you're in agriculture, you don't do it for a hobby. The work is hard, the hours are long. You do it to make money. I urge you, as you move forward, to make a decision that is equitable for all members of Mason County. Think about the future. We've got young farmers in this group on both sides. Think about the future of Mason County. But my biggest thing is that we want Mason County and we want solar in Mason County to be an experiment. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Is Keith Gifford here? No? And Eric Wesley? No? People, we are family at the end of the names that wish to speak tonight. So if you haven't learned anything, I don't know what to tell you. At this time, do I have a motion to end the meeting? In the, in the uh, public hearing. In the public, I'm sorry. Do I have a motion to go out of the public hearing? I have a motion by Peggy and seconded by Tom Cole. All in favor say aye. Okay. And uh, do you make a motion to adjourn? I know that Michael has something to say, and this gentleman here has something to say. If, if the chairman would recognize me, uh, I'm Daniel Hunt. You, you've now recessed the, the hearing, correct? Yes. I, if I could just make, and I understand I'm standing between you and everybody else in the door, so I will be brief. Uh, my name is Daniel Hunt. I'd like to make a couple statements very quickly. If the the com commission will allow me. Um, I just want, my name is Dan Hunt. I'm an attorney. I represent Bill Marshall. I will be very quick. For the record, it's not part of the public hearing. And this is for both sides of this issue. Stop. I submitted a letter 
on the 15th, which was recognized at the first meeting. Uh, I know this woman down front who is doing the Lord's work for two days, right, trying to keep up with everyone. I just want to make sure, for the record, that it's also orally recorded that we stand by those objections that were submitted and entered into uh, the to record. I want to put that on the oral record tonight. Um, to the young gentleman that was removed earlier, is he still here? I had a speech, but I had a speech. Anyone that was removed, at least I would ask the commission, no matter what side they're on, if they can submit that in writing, I think that's fair. I think a mistake might have been made over here. Mistakes happen. If that individual wanted to talk, I don't know. He was, he was forced out. Uh, I'd also reference that um, the first night, uh, individuals were required to offer their testimony under oath. I don't think that occurred tonight. If on the first night, no matter what side of the issue that individual was on, uh, if that pro pro prohibited them from speaking, I think the commission should consider that later. It could have stifled some speech that we wouldn't. We don't want that to occur. We want both sides to be able to say whatever they want to say. And if that stifled speech for anyone, they should be considered. The last item is Mr. Reed. Uh, the issue has been raised. Bias has been shown. He should consider recusing himself from further uh, discussions on these issues. Uh, the standard is set in the Hilltop versus Boone County. We think the standard has been made. We're raising that issue before the commission. Doesn't need to decide it tonight, but needs to be aware of it. Uh, that we're putting that objection out there tonight for the record. That's all I have. I thank you all very much for the for the time and consideration. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. I'm sure they will be answered. Thank so. you. If anyone would like to know where we go from here, the record is now closed. Joint Planning Commission has heard what it's going to hear on this issue, unless they decide to hold another public hearing, which I very much doubt. We know that everybody wants a decision as soon as possible. The community needs a decision as soon as possible. Having said that, the Commission needs time to consider everything that's been put in front of us. Our court reporter, needs time to put together the transcript. We've got written comments that need to be copied. All this stuff needs to be given to the commission. They need time to look over it. I anticipate having uh, meetings of the commission to consider everything that they've heard probably in early 2022. We hope to have a decision for the community soon. That's what we're thinking. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Thank you for voicing your opinion, offering what you had to say. We're, we're trying to do the very best we can for the community, trying to get as much input as we can. We're going to do the best we can. Thank you. Have a good evening.